Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Paul's guest today is Sydney Ross Singer. Professor Singer is a pioneer in the field of applied medical anthropology, specifically focusing on how to prevent disease by eliminating the cultural cause. He is the director of the Institute for the Study of Culturogenic Disease and the author of several books on lifestyle-related health problems, including Dress to Kill, The Link Between Breast Cancer and Bras, which details the groundbreaking bra and breast cancer study. Ladies, did you know your bra may be killing you? Men, did you know your partner's bra could be making her a medical statistic? Mothers start their children with training bras as early as eight years of age, but few mothers are aware of the fact that there can be serious long-term consequences to restricting the rib cage, breathing, circulatory flow, lymphatic flow, the postural and structural consequences of wearing a bra, and much more. In this in-depth and sometimes quite intense discussion with medical anthropologist and author Sid Singer, both men and women will learn a lot as I deeply explore the social, cultural influences and antiquated ideas that led to our chronic use of bras and many other important issues, such as the effect of metal underwires and bras, belly button and nose rings, the mechanics of scar tissue and fascia, and much more. This podcast is sure to make you all think deeply, and it's likely to result in a lot of bras being tossed in the garbage can where, quite frankly, I think they belong. I hope you enjoy my discussion with Sid Singer as much as I did. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. I have a very interesting guest for you today. Sid Singer, author of an amazing book called Dress to Kill, The Link Between Breast Cancer and Bras. And we are going to talk about a lot of things that a lot of women and men don't realize about bras some of the issues about bras, some of you have heard me talking about over the years, especially if you're a Czech professional. And uh, it's a great opportunity to talk to someone who's devoted a lot of time, energy, and research into the subject. So, Sid, welcome to Living 4D. Well, thank you, Paul. It's great to be with you. Um, I mentioned your book, uh, Dress to Kill. You also have another one called Get It Off, Understanding the Cause of Breast Pain, Cysts, and Cancer. Um, are those the two books that you have out there? Or am I missing any? Well, about this issue, those are the two books. Um, and uh, yeah, I have other books. We've done other other work on lifestyle caused disease, but these are the two. Dress to Kill Second Edition just came out um, last year, and it's uh, uh, it, it's updated with um, new studies and um, the reaction that we've had for the past twenty five years dealing with this issue. Okay, great. And I'll also share your website is brafreestudy.com. So, and, and we'll probably mention that again at the end or possibly throughout the discussion. There's another website as well. It's bra, it's brasandbreastcancer.org. Okay. okay, let me write that down. The Bra Free Study, is, as I'll talk about, is actually an ongoing international study. Um, with Currently, we have 36 countries uh women from 36 countries involved in the study and people can join that for free at bra free study. Um, but bras and breast cancer.org is a, a discussion of the issue, um, that we're going to be talking about today. So both are good websites. Okay. That's fantastic to know. It's a very interesting topic of discussion, but to begin, could you give us an overview of your background, your education, and what led to your interest in and study in the effects of bras on women's health? Yes. Well, um, okay. For my background, I have a, a pretty eclectic background. Um, I have a, had, had a hard time fitting into any one specialty. So I sort of developed um, my own of applied medical anthropology. So I'm a medical anthropologist, but my background is in medicine, biochemistry, anthropology, and medical humanities. And um, what we try to do is understand how our lifestyle makes us sick, how our culture makes us sick because it's not just lifestyle. There's a lot to do with culture that beyond just lifestyle. Um, and we came upon the bra issue actually because of a personal, uh, situation. Uh, when I left medical school, um, I actually was very dis, uh, just very, uh, disappointed with my medical training because so much of it was basically just diagnosing a disease to figure out what drug to give. Amen. And what, 
And when it came to prevention, they knew nothing about it. And then all of their stuff was on animal studies, which are not even necessarily predictive of human response anyway. So the whole experience was not a healing, teaching how to be a healer. And I was, I remember in class, um, one day we were, one of the professors said, you know, the biggest predictor of health and disease, actually, the biggest predictor of disease is low income. And that's, to me, that was important. And I said, well, shouldn't we as doctors then be working towards dealing with that problem and, and improving people's uh, income and, and, you know, economic issues, because obviously that's affecting health. And of course, that's not what doctors do. Medical doctors are trained to give drugs and surgery in the treatment of um, disease. And when it comes to preventing by changing the culture, changing the way you live, changing the products you use, uh, that's nothing medicine really deals with. They're, they're sort of like, um, um, it, I, I've after years of dealing with this, I, I equate doctors to uh, somebody in times of war. We have a medic. You know, we, we're all living like in the jungle in war uh, in this culture. And you go out and you get sick from the things that you need to do, and you go to your doctor and they just patch you up and send you right back out there. That's what a medic does. They're not there to stop the war. They're there to keep you fighting, and that's what medicine does. It, it helps you. Um, try to avoid the symptoms of disease so you can go out and continue doing whatever you're doing, which is causing the disease in the first place. So we figured the way to really treat disease uh, and uh, is to prevent it. The best thing to do is prevent disease. So you don't have to treat it. But the best way to approach disease is by trying to understand the lifestyle cause. And when my we were in Fiji after I left medical school and we were working on a completely different medical problem when my wife discovered a lump in her breast. And uh, that was a shocker for us. She's a healthy person. She was very healthy with uh, a great vegetarian diet. I mean, the kind of person you think would not get breast cancer or any other breast disease. And she was pregnant with our son at the time. So we uh, freaked out and came back to the States. And after, um, but a very interesting thing happened um, about a week before she discovered this lump. We were on a very remote island. And um, Soma, my wife and co-author and co-researcher, Soma Grissmeyer, she was hanging out some bras on the line to let them dry. She was wearing bras at that time in her life. And um, a girl came over to us who had never seen bras before. And she looked at it and what's that? What is that? She was curious. And why do you, she, she grabbed it and stretched it and, and said, isn't it tight? And Soma said, well, I suppose it is, but you get used to it. And she asked, why do you wear it? And Soma says, well, just women in my culture wear them. They're just expected to. And she really didn't have a good answer. And then a week later, this thing happens with the lump. We come back to the States and after flying from Fiji back to California, where we lived at the time, uh, it's a long flight. We went in to take a shower and she took off her bra and there were these red marks and indentations around her chest from the bra, you know, from the straps and around the whole perimeter of the chest. And it was clear her bra was pressing into her skin quite tightly. So it, it, now we were looking for clues. I mean, we were wondering what could, what could we have done to ourselves that caused this? And that was like the first clue. Could, what, what is that? What are, what are red marks and indentations in your skin signs of? And they're really signs of constriction and compression. And then the next question is, well, what would get constricted and compressed most easily? And I, I thought, well, the lymphatic system is the most easy thing to compress. And, and that, what would that cause? Well, it would cause tissue congestion and uh, you know, the, the body wouldn't be able to flush fluid out from the breast, metabolic waste products and anything else you took into your body that gets stuck in your, in your fluid and the tissue spaces and the lymph fluid that has to flush out via the lymphatics and they're very easily compressed by pressure so if they're getting compressed by the bra gee that could make the lymph fluids stay there and the breasts get progressively toxified over time and if you do this day after day year after year wow i wonder if that can cause cancer and what else it might cause well we went to this is in the early 90s and we went to uh you know there wasn't an internet to look things up on and uh we couldn't find anything at that time on this issue anything. And it, it was, it was rather shocking because 
thinking about bras linked to breast disease is like shoes and foot disease. You know, it, it's if your feet hurt, the first thing you should think is, my, what am I doing to my feet? And wow, I'm putting, I, I just bought these new shoes. Maybe that's why my feet are hurting. I mean, kind of obvious. But when it comes to bras and breasts, women are so conditioned to feel that they're normal part of their anatomy. They have them since puberty. They wear them every day, some 24-7. And they, they've got to never think, they don't even know what it's like to have a normal breast that's unconstricted by bras and doesn't have chronic lymphedema, basically. So, um, so women ignore this whole thing. And it was never, I thought it was never really researched at all. And, and that was mind blowing. Cause the first thing you think is if it's true, there'd be studies, right? But it doesn't work that way. I've discovered a lot of truths are just totally silenced because they don't make any money or they threaten an industry. And there's a tremendous burden on any researcher who comes up with something that challenges an industry or challenges the status quo. And they get, I know from my personal experience, and I know from communicating with a lot of doctors about things that they did that that just crossed the industries, they get really blasted. And some of them get their licenses threatened. And they, oh man, it's incredible. I could tell you stories about this later. So well, I, I know plenty yeah. of my own. <laughs> oh yeah. So, it, so you're, you're dealing with um, a medical system that ignores very obvious truths. If studies do come out, they'll ignore and bury the studies if they allow them to even be published because peer review is basically a censorship process and has nothing to do with quality as we've seen. Um, so w the medical system is this huge business that's focused on disease treatment and they get people when they're desperate at all stages of disease, decay and dying. And of course, people trust them with everything and, and you can't trump these people and say, wait a minute, I don't care if you're whatever degree you have that's says you follow the protocols of your particular uh, specialty, there's the, this, is a, this is an issue that's true. But, you know, so the media has to, like, who do they trust? Who do you believe? The good thing about this, Paul, um, all right, so the, the bottom line is that's how we got into this. We did our own study. But the really good thing about this that's kept this alive is that when women take off their bras, they feel so much healthier in a very short period of time that it confirms clearly and tangibly that the bra was hurting them and damaging their breasts and their health. And that has kept this issue alive despite all of the resistance because women will hear me at a talk. They'll literally take their bras off under their blouse and hand it to me at the end of my talk and say, you convinced me. And then they'll find that their breast cysts go away. Their breast pain goes away. They can breathe easier. And they have like their self-esteem changes. They have huge amounts of changes in their life once they stop um, wearing these bras and feeling like they need to, to be acceptable. Well, that's the psychological side of what, what reinforces that bra usage and, and self, um, it's, it's really a self-denying and self, uh, um, masochistic type of a thing. A lot of women are tremendously uncomfortable in their bras, but they feel that they, they have to wear them to work. How can I go to work with what God forbid my nipple will protrude through my blouse. And yeah, you know, it's insane. I, I, it's insane. But they're brainwashed and conditioned to feel that way. So that's been part of the problem and the challenge that we're dealing. That's the nature of a culturogenic disease. And that's what I ended up starting, the Institute for the Study of Culturogenic Disease. Culturogenic simply means culture generate, culture caused. And we study these issues in, and the resistance to them and the physical, obvious physical con connections that you would make just logically and by personal experience that are ignored by medicine. I mean, they never even think about tight clothing and how it affects health when it's so obvious anyway. I mean, it's obvious, but they never, never will talk about tight clothing except rarely in lymphedema treatment after they've already cut out your lymphatics and they, and you're getting lymphedema and then they'll say, don't wear a bra because it'll make it worse at cutting off your flow. And, but what about before you had breast cancer? It's the same problem, but they, they can't talk about it because it's a huge multi-billion dollar bra industry and a huge breast cancer treatment industry. And they are going to be, um, they they, they've been resisting this in many, many ways that has shown me, um, the, the, the corruption in our medical system. Absolutely incredible. Well, yeah, I don't, we don't really, <clears throat> aside from emergency medicine, I think we have a disease maintenance system because <laughs> any, 
any kind of real medical care. I mean, to address the economic issues, the diet and lifestyle factors and all the things that the public actually knows, but doesn't seem to take the initiative to address themselves. If medicine actually practiced medicine, it would uh, lose you know, trillions of dollars because they would actually address the etiology of the problem and there wouldn't be a lot of the issues that cause health problems today. Well, you, I agree totally. And you know, it's funny, in the past, uh, I don't know if you remember the author Robert Mendelson, MD. Do you remember him at all? Yes. Yeah. He was awesome. He was like a, an inspiration when I quit medicine. Um, he, uh, he used to bring out the statistic that when doctors go on strike, the death rate goes down. Yes, uh, I, I actually... Uh, a friend of mine, one of my instructors, forwarded me a news report from Israel. Yes, and uh, it talked about how when the doctors were on strike, they the uh, fe- owners of funeral homes were complaining like hell to the government because there was nobody dying. I know, I know, I know. You know, it, and it, and the thing is, it's you know they medicine has uh, nobody to trump. Nobody is the authority over them. That's what's really frightening. Even the media, like they have been saying about the brown bread, they, by they, I mean the American Cancer Society, who I've spoken to directly, but I spoke with their director of public communications on this. And they've been, he's been fighting me. He's like my, he's like the Joker to my Batman for the last 25 years, you know, trying to deal with this issue. Every time I light a fire, they're there to say no. There's no evidence. And then I'm showing studies and they, we don't believe those studies. And then they actually, uh, not just the American Cancer Society, but you know they—they're—they're this. They are the thought uh, tr- trendsetters on on cancer. So the government, National Cancer Institute, is represented by them. I mean, they—they they are on the board of that. So they are setting the entire standard of what is the truth in cancer. Well, it, you're you're dealing with a belief system. You know, yes. medicine medicine is a belief system, and by definition, belief systems are closed, <laughs> and they attack any alternate belief or idea quite <laughs> intensely yes uh, you know so all you got to do is look into any ism and you will see that there is a belief system at play and and we're dealing not with a medical system we're dealing with a really what i call organized crime oh yes yeah. as- aside from the fact that you know i don't want to be uh, unfair to say there are situations where doctors do help people and do good things so we have to shine the light and give credit where credit is due, but the system itself is not supportive of addressing the real issues that lead to people's most common ailments. It's fine for acute, for trauma, but it's beyond that. It's not very effective. Oh, I totally, I totally agree with that. So, um, you know, so we did our study getting back to how we, why do we even think this was true? You know, we did a study on five major cities uh, throughout the United States and we interviewed women, both with, with, with women who have a diagnosis of breast cancer and women who don't have a diagnosis or not yet anyway. And we asked about their past bra wearing habits and behaviors. And we wanted to know, you know, if, if this is true, you'd expect women to wear bras a woman with breast cancer would have a different bra wearing culture and habits and behavior than women who don't have breast cancer. And it's, it's really interesting. It's hard in cultures where there's almost all the women are wearing bras that, you know, it looks, it's so normal. Hi, in this often intense discussion with medical anthropologist Sid Singer, on the many dangers of bras, we refer back to the importance of basic health, good food, optimal breathing, good nutrition, not getting trapped in antiquated ideas and fashion industry fads, and the importance of natural movement for your body. There's no question we're living in a fast-paced world and that many don't have or take the time to prepare fresh, organic, whole food meals. But I have great news. Organifi offers a wide variety of excellent, good-tasting, easy-to-prepare superfoods, protein powders, and drinks that my family, friends, and clients use regularly. You can taste and feel the nutrition right away, and I know you'll love Organifi's great products. Go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and at checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K20 to get your 20% purchase discount. To get to know Drew Canoli, the founder of Organifi, listen to my podcast with Drew, which is number 64, titled UBU, 
And I think you'll really love Drew and you'll get a strong sense that he has very, very honest, good values. And when you meet the man behind the product, I think you'll realize that it's really worth the investment. I know I love their product. My family loves it. And I wouldn't dare try to offer it to you if I didn't feel really good about it. So enjoy Organifi and use your Check20 code and get your 20% discount. Lots of love. And what's really interesting too, and I'm sure you'll find this uh, interesting, Paul, is that when, if you think about an image of the breasts and you went into an anatomy book right now and you were to look at the, at, at the breasts, two things are very interesting. Number one, I've, my son who's studying right now in, in physiology and anatomy, I looked at his book. They actually have these, the figures with some of the anatomy, but the female figures are wearing a bra. I mean, it's, my, oh, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it's I've, like, I've seen some of these pictures. They, they have it in physical therapy books as well. It's pretty common out there. Isn't that retarded? Um, it's ridiculous. You have a bra on a figure. I mean, we have such a hard time thinking of the female body without a bra that even in a professional book, they put a bra on it. Okay. That's the, that's the first thing. And the second thing is all of these images throughout the 20th century are most likely of bra using women. So their idea of a healthy, of, of a normal healthy breast in quotes is one that could have fibrocystic breast disease. You know, they consider that normal though. You go to the doctor, I have this pain and these cysts. They'll say, yeah, they're normal. No, they're only normal in a bra wearing culture. Like coughing up phlegm is normal in a smoking culture. If everybody smoked and everybody was coughing up phlegm, you know, you would say, yeah, it's a lot of phlegm in the morning and totally normal. But the, if you had a non-smoker and you saw how they were, you'd be, oh my God, what planet are you from? So that's the problem. Our books, our textbooks, our references are of women who have damaged breasts. They're bra using breasts. It's like if only images of feet that we see in, in, um, in anatomy books were of feet that have been in constrictive foot shaping shoes. Because that's what happens to the feet. And, you know, you look with the toes pointing, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Of course, yes. So if you go to an anatomy book and you're looking at pictures of feet, are they taking it of people who are barefoot all their lives or people who've been wearing shoes ever since they're infants? That's the problem. Our frame of reference for the breast issue is a bra used usage, is, is a breast that's been uh, um, basically constricted and compressed by a bra since puberty. Yeah, there's a couple of comments that I'd like to share in regard to what you've just said. And I run across this, you know, I, I run a, a multidisciplinary holistic health education institute that's mm -hmm. worldwide. We mm -hmm. have medical doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors, osteopaths, it, you name it, everything from housewives to dance and movement educators to surgeons. Mm -hmm. And I'm regularly confronted by students who are challenging something that I'm teaching and they'll hand me research papers or site research and I'll look right at it and I'll see right away that they're they you know to, to do a study you have to have a normal group you have to have a reference group mm -hmm. so one of the first things I say is I'd like you to tell me based on what this study says and how it was designed how they identified who was normal you're comparing sick people that are called normal because mm -hmm. it's normal to be sick and you're basing the research on sick people. Mm -hmm. And this has happened with core control issues, with breathing issues, with all sorts of movement dynamics. I mean, the list is very, very long. And we've gotten to the point where uh, studies are done to show things, but they don't realize that you can't effectively rely on a study that's based on a false premise to start with. Mm -hmm. Totally. The other thing is, and this is something I, I had in there, you know, where I asked you, what do you feel the social cultural influences are today that have women so conditioned to bras? And, uh, you know, a lot of my work deals with people's mental, emotional and psychological challenges. And I've studied depth psychology for over 20 years and uh, all aspects of psychology. So I and I work mm -hmm. with people from around the world that fail in the medical system. That's what I'm most famous for. And one of the things that I see is a very strong influence on this is puritanical Christian values that have led to this need to constantly cover up and wear bras. And I think that mm -hmm. this 
may very well be the influence that's leading to, you know, even medical books covering women's breasts. I'm wondering, what do you feel about religious influences? Mm. And, and, you know, there's a long history in Christianity of, of shaming women's mm-hmm. bodies, shaming women, trying to cover them up, priests trying to get rid of them because they can't control their sex drive. And we know what that's led to, especially in the Catholic Church. I'm just curious, what, what's your observation on religious influence on the issue of bras? Well, you know, it's an interesting, interesting point. Um, I agree with what you're saying as, as body shaming and feeling that, you know, the nipple is sexualized and uh, you can't look at it. And it's really dis- and discomfort with sex. But it's not just there, there are some other things that might mitigate that. For example, if Mormons uh, wear they wear undergarments. And they have actually have lower rates of breast cancer, and it could be the undergarment uh, bra combination makes them wear looser bras, or they may wear them differently. Uh, and they're, I, I'm not sure about Seventh Day Adventists and their clothing, uh, and how much they wear bras. I know they have lower they, breast they, cancer. They wear them for sure. I was, I was when I was a young man, I got kicked out of public school twice and had to go to a Seventh Day Adventist private school. And let me tell you. I was kicked out of public school for being a wild child. And when I got there, I found out that I was, uh, I was a slow, lazy, wild man. I mean, I never seen such drug use and rampant no. sex. It was wild. Well, what about, I think it's Mennonites that I was, uh, I remember I just spoke with a woman who is um, a, a religious MD that deals with Mennonites. And she yeah. said that they, I believe they don't wear bras. They have much lower rates of breast cancer. And I'd love to be able to study that group. Um, but so my point is that some religions, because of their practice and garments, they may actually mitigate it. Nuns, by the way, this is interesting. Nuns, uh, breast cancer used to be called nuns disease. And that's wow. because they used to to desexualize their breasts. They would bind them as tight as they can. Yes, and I've s- seen that. Yeah, so that in- and and they actually were known for cancer. And it, and recently, last year, this guy contacted me. Who's an he's an historian. He just wrote a book called Tyranny of the Bra, and he's citing my work in there. But he went through history to find the cases of breast cancer because sometimes people will argue, "Oh, there's been breast cancer before there were bras, so why you know th- there's always been breast cancer around." Uh, so you can't say it's from the bras. Well, first of all, that's illogical. It's not saying the only cause is bras, uh, and bras just contribute. Uh, as I'll, as I'll further explain, they're part of the 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 um, they set up the breast for disease anyway. If they don't cause the cancer themselves, but there's other causes. Um, the other thing is when they said that breast cancer, they were the earliest cases. Those were actually in men, not even women. And when he went through history, the only times there was breast cancer was when there was a culture where they were binding the breasts. And in fact, in China, just as they did foot binding, they did breast binding and they had breast cancer like crazy for centuries associated with that. But in European culture, they used to leave the breast open during the Middle Ages and there wasn't as much binding. And breast cancer was very rare. And when you look at cultures today, it, it's the, the developed countries are the ones with, that, that have Western fashion and wear bras are the ones where breast cancer is the highest. You go to bra free cultures, they hardly have any breast cancer. And when they move from their culture to Western culture and start adopting Western styles, their breast cancer rates go up. If you go to a culture like in, uh, in, in, the Maori in the Maoris or the indigenous people of New Zealand, they are completely uh, incorporated into the culture and westernized, and they wear bras and they have the same rates as the whites there. But if you go to New Ze- uh, to Australia where the Aborigines are, the Aborigines are much more marginalized. They're much more into their uh, non-Western ways, and they do not wear bras, and they have virtually no breast cancer. So it's a pattern that we noticed actually before we even did our study. We we looked around the world, and bras br- bra wearing cultures are where there was high breast cancer rates. And then we the study we asked about you know their how long have you worn it every day? Are you aware of the tightness? Uh, does it leave red marks? Um, and what we found, and, and they're at it, so like, why do you wear them? Is it for appearance or for comfort? And and we found that, you know, a lot of women just 
um, they, they don't, they didn't really think about it until we asked them. They took a lot of things for granted. And the longer and tighter they wore their bra, the higher their breast cancer rates were. In fact, bra free women from our study, bra free women have about the same rate of breast cancer as men. Men get it at about one, one hundredth the rate, a hundred women to one male breast cancer. That's the proportion. And that's the same proportion as a bra free woman compared to a 24 seven bra user. And we found that by 12, we asked less than 12 hours, uh, then 12 to, um, um, more than 12 hours, but, but not to bed and then sleep 24 hours. And we found that by 12 hours, it started to go up really high. And then 24 seven was a hundred, I mean, 125 times bigger than bra free. So a uh, three, three fourths of the women, according to our study, three fourths of the women who sleep in their bras and just don't take them off basically are going to get breast cancer. And, but what was really amazing, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're talking breast cancer is still a, a, a small percentage of, of total women. When you look at all the women who are wearing bras, more than half of them have breast pain and cysts chronically. Yeah. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of women that they are damaging their breasts from their bras. Most of them wear them too tight. The industry has done, done their own research. Over 90% are wearing them too tightly. And the thing is, how do you wear an, a bra not tightly? Okay. Let's think about what the bra is. It's a device designed to alter the shape of your breast for cultural reasons, aesthetics, nothing to do with need. The body wasn't designed with a flaw that requires lifting of the breasts with this lingerie. It's totally a cultural thing. And, um, and to change the breast shape, you have to apply pressure, which the bra does constantly to keep the breasts in that shape. And it's this pressure that constricts lymphatics, which are these microscopic vessels that passively drain fluid using one-way valves to keep it moving towards your lymph nodes, most of which are in your armpit for the breast drainage. And um, these, these small lymphatic vessels are very easily compressed because they have no internal pressure. They're passively draining with movement, with breathing, which is another thing. Movement of the breasts is important to help with the pumping of the lymph. And when you yeah. walk naturally, your breasts move and have a natural sway and bounce to them that helps these organs flush. And the breasts are full of fluid and full of lymphatics because when they lactate as they're meant to, they need a large blood supply. And so they, they are, um, their the circulation is essential for all health, but in the breast, they're a particularly high circulation organ. So any compression f of the breast to re -change their, to change their shape, push them up, create cleavage, do whatever to keep them from drooping, and which is you know a strange concept, then all of that interferes with the way the breasts actually function because of, of circulation and interfering with the lymphatics. Um, it also compresses, it, it keeps the breasts immobilized so they can't move. So, you know, one of your questions was about exercise. I mean, do women need a bra for exercise? I don't know what, what your take is on that, but I'll tell you mine if you want to know. Well, you know, the, the, as I think you probably are hip, the reason you reached out to me, because I already speak publicly about bras and I've been looking into this issue for well, I've been doing my work here for 36 years, and I started seeing clinically all the way back in the late 80s as a clinical massage therapist. And I worked with a chiropractor, and I uh, later then I moved into a physical therapy clinic. I was the first sports massage therapist ever hired full time by a physical therapy clinic in the entire city of San Diego. And I specialized in medical failures. I had a lot of other skills that I incorporated into my work. So I wasn't, I, my license was a massage therapist, but I'm really a holistic health practitioner. That's what my, what my final licensure became. But what I saw clinically was I had all sorts of cases of thoracic outlet syndrome and breathing pattern disorders mm -hmm. and swelling in the arms and in the fingers that was causing mm -hmm. coupled with pins and needles and, uh, women complaining that their hands were cold all the time and, you know, things that can be misdiagnosed as various neurological diseases, for example. Mm -hmm. And so having studied anatomy and physiology very extensively, I've done five cadaver dissections and, you know, spent a lot of time studying all the issues 
involved. And so one of the things that I noticed right away is there's no way I could restore the breathing pattern of a woman that was wearing a bra unless I had them loosen it to the point that it left no marks on their skin whatsoever and gave room to expand. And one of the things I, I did a, a lot of training with a, f- a, f- a famous physical therapist who's also uh, a dentist named Mariano Roccobato, and he works in the physiotherapy and dental department at the University of Santiago, Chile. And I spent uh, several years studying with him. And one of the things that Roccobato taught us about a lot with regard to forces in the body was a concept called light elastic forces. And so he explained to us in our training that it only takes one gram of, pr- of pressure to move a tooth and you can relocate a tooth significantly. And he showed us, you know, people that had huge gaps in their teeth. And then within six months or so, only using as little as one gram of pressure through the use of braces, then the teeth, the gap would close. So what he was showing us is that as a therapist, we have to be very, very concerned about chronic light elastic forces that we don't think make a difference, but they can seriously alter the function and the anatomy and the physiology of the body. Mm -hmm. And so when I started seeing these problems with the breasts and having an awareness of what a light light elastic force was, I started sticking my finger under women's bra straps and pulling on it and just sort of guesstimating, well, how much force is that? And I found women whose bras were so tight, there was like a one centimeter indentation and I would have them take their bras off at the beginning of an hour session and the, and the marks would still be there like they'd just taken it off an hour later because they had so much lymphatic congestion. And so you, you had pooling and edema. And, mm-hmm. and so what I explained to them was I said, look, the average person breathes 25,900 breaths a day. So I would at times take a little scale and say, okay, look, I've got a pull on this bra strap with one pound of pressure or X grams of pressure. Now multiply that by 25,900 times and you come up with this massive number. And then I would show them on an anatomy chart, the primary muscles that you're using to expand your rib cage are your little tiny scalene muscles and your intercostal muscles. And you're expecting them to do thousands of pounds of work. And I showed them how these muscle imbalance syndromes that were being set up by the bras were causing forward head posture, which was altering the position of their jaw, crowding their ribs, leading to the circulatory dysfunctions you've shown. It was causing uh, chronic uh, rigid kyphosis. It was disrupting athletic ability, movement ability. I mean, the list was on and on. Mm-hmm. And and so I would tell, I would talk to women about this and, you know, a lot of them just had a laundry list of reasons from aesthetic reasons to religious reasons to most of them. The most common thing it boiled down to was they believed that if they didn't wear their bras, that their boobs were going to droop and become saggy. And I said to them, look, you know, if you look at native cultures around the world, yes, some women have saggy boobs, but some don't. That's more genetic than it has anything to do with the bra. And who cares if your boobs sag a little bit? What would you rather have? Uh, some kind of a disease? Have your, you know, a surgeon have to remove your first rib because your brachial plexus is chronically crowded? Do you want to be spending the next 20 years of your life going constantly to therapists to get palliative care? Or do you want to take care of yourself? Well, you know, ironically, the bra makes them droop more. And that was shown by um, a French physiology professor and exercise uh, physiologist um, he he followed women uh, when they took when they stopped wearing bras their breasts lifted and toned and that's something we found in our bra free study um, where we having women just stop wearing bras and we're going to follow them and show that we expect they're going to have lower breast cancer rates but we also wanted to see what happens to them when they stop t- you know wearing bras and we ask you know we ask them to give us feedback and they say that their breasts lift in tone. They've confirmed this. Hi, everybody. You know, every now and then, a miracle happens. And I get to meet a genius who shares the same values as I do, reads many of the same books, and loves Rudolf Steiner, and creates amazing products 
very much in line with Steiner's philosophy, which I think is phenomenal. Chervine is the founder of Symbiotica, and he's a nutritional consultant to some of the top athletes in the world. And I've tested all of his products, and I've even been involved in helping with selecting some of the materials to formulate some of them. So I know damn well how good they are. Angie, Mana, our little boy, Zoe, and Angie and Penny all love them, and we use them regularly. And Chervine has put a lot of effort into making healthy, holistic, synergistic, food-based products. These are not isolate supplements. They're food-based products. In fact, the word symbiotica means symbiosis, which means harmony, and bios means life, so harmony and life. And I asked Chervine to come share an overview of what makes his product so unique and special, and I'm going to let him do that before I tell you about the offer we're going to share with you today. So Chervin, tell us what makes Symbiotica so unique. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. The highest organic nutrients sourced all over the world to bring you the most efficient, complex biotics ever. Perfect. And I believe it. I tested them. I used them. Everything comes from GMP organic certified labs, all with certificate of analysis. And I come from a biodynamic background which is you know, looking at the whole as the opposed whole, yeah. to the isolate. Steiner's the founder of that. That's correct. And so all of these products have full synergy in the body to create absolute homeostasis. Premature aging, disease prevention, pain, frustration, all of those things are lack of nutrients. Yes. So we wanted to provide all of those missing nutri nutrients that we are missing from our food today and bringing it out to everybody to be able to use them. Yes, and I love the fact that your packaging is extremely non-toxic and highly protective. Share a little bit about your packaging because just the cost of the packaging is worth more than what's in most people's what they think is expensive nutrition supplements. Yeah, we're doing everything outside of the standard business model, and this is a passion movement for me. So just the packaging had to represent the alchemy that's contained within. So we use myron glass, which is blocking X amount of UVA and UVB right. rays and other electromagnetic frequencies, and everything is recyclable. Everything comes from biodegradable materials, this is the only way we can share Symbiotica to the world. And as you've shared, they're highly mycelized, so they're very, very absorbable, and they're food-based products so that they're, they're not things that last forever on the shelf. When you open them, they need to be refrigerated and treated as living foods because they're living products. We're not designed to eat powders and pills and tablets. We're designed no. to get our nutrition from food. This is the closest thing. So we took the technology above liposomal technology and introduced micelle, which is encoding all the nutrients in a phospholipid fat. So it passes all the barriers and makes its way to the bloodstream completely intact. Awesome. Well, there you have it right from the formulator, the founder of Symbiotica, and somebody who I highly respect and love, Shervin. Go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com and on checkout to get 15% on any of his excellent products, use the code, all caps, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 for your 15% discount anytime you want them. That's your check special discount. Check all of his products out, read carefully, and let me have your feedback. My family uses them. I use them regularly. And they are absolutely awesome, or I would not share them with you. Thanks for showing, sharing with me today, Shervine. It's my honor. Yeah, I can tell you exactly why when you're ready. Well, I think I, um, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd like to hear that. You want to go ahead now, and I'll, I'll tell you another aspect of that, maybe. Yeah, sure. You know, so what? Ha just like I said, one of the things that happens when you wear a bra is it overworks your scalene muscles, which are in the anterior neck. So they run from your cervical spine down to your first and second ribs, and they're the primary muscles that elevate the rib cage to create a negative pressure in the thorax so you can draw air into your body. And when those muscles start to get overloaded, then you start getting secondary muscle recruitment. So in comes the upper trapezius, which inserts at the occiput. So it, it inserts behind the center of gravity of the cranium. And then if they keep overloading, then the levator scapula gets in. So what happens, you start getting secondary recruitment because the primary breathing muscles burn out, get exhausted, get full of trigger points. The adaptation to the trigger points is muscle shortening and tightening. 
which is followed by fibrous tissue development. Fibrous tissue is a form of scar tissue. As it matures, it shrinks and tightens. So actually what happens is it pulls their whole body down and forward. And for every inch the head goes forward in the sagittal plane, research shows it adds the weight of the head to the neck extensors again. So the average person's head weighs 8% of their body weight. So when your head is, when you're standing in upright neutral posture, your head's balanced on your neck. When your head is one inch forward, you have 8% of your body weight chronically hanging off the muscles. I, I would say the average person that I measure out there has anywhere between three and a half and six inches of forward head posture when they're coming to me for clinical help. So when you take the bra off, all of a sudden they can breathe better. And now they don't have the load on the respiratory system. And so therefore the muscles begin to relax, which allows their posture to return. And because they don't have constriction of the rib cage, it doesn't lock up the thoracic spine. So it allows the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical spine mechanics to integrate, which allows the body to move and pump, which then activates the extensor muscles of the spine and the retractor muscles of the scapula. So all of a sudden now, you know, the pectoral fascia attaches to the collarbone and the acromion. So if a woman's head comes down and forward, so does the shoulders. And as they adapt and get corrective exercise and breathe properly, the head begins to retract naturally. The scapula begins to retract, which lifts the breast. I tell women all the time, before you get a boob job, give me three months <laughs> of corrective stretching, mobilization, and exercise. And so far, the only woman that I haven't been able to please to the point she avoided plastic surgery were women that were going into the modeling profession and needed uh, breast augmentation or they couldn't get jobs as models. Interesting. Well, you know, I, uh, that sounds really fascinating. And to add to that... Another aspect of this, I, I was thinking, because I'm, I'm focused on lymphatics, and if a woman's breasts are have lymphedema, they're heavy. And once they get rid of the bra, the lymphedema goes away, and their breasts aren't as congested, and they're lighter, and they, they lift on their own. because they were so, so women are making their breasts droopier and heavier by the constriction. The other thing is the bra is serving as like an external artificial support, so the internal Cooper's ligaments, you know, the suspensory ligaments in the breasts will atrophy yeah. from non-use and, you know, right. it's use it or lose it. So once they get rid of the bra, the breasts can start toning and lifting from what you said and, and also from, from these, you know, direct breast uh, effects and, and being able to breathe easier universally, every woman in our study that's taken their bra off, they all say I could breathe easier. And interestingly, about 20 years ago out of Japan, there's like a textile institute there that was studying the studies the effects of clothing on health and they found that wearing a, a, a bra or a girdle has an effect on the sympathetic nervous system the autonomic nervous system and it causes lots of different changes and i'm not sure of the nature of the effect if it's just somehow squeezing the nerves from compression um i can tell you when you're ready okay I, i'm i'm worried i'm wondering if that's the cause or if it's um uh just the discomfort if you have anything that's tight on you i think your body knows that it can't stay there or you're going to be damaged. And I think that causes stress because what ends, ends up happening is these, basically these women get like a stress response. They have higher body temperature. Their melatonin secretion goes down too, by the way. Um, salivary melatonin they've measured. They've measured core body temperature and digestive rate. And digestion is different without a bra. It's, it's, it's quicker. So when you put a bra on, it slows digestion. It also affects menstruation. I, and, and in fact, in my study, it was confirmed, and these are studies that have been done, uh, not just mine. I'm just seeing the same effect confirming what they found in other women. So the bra is affecting full body effects in addition to its effect on, on the breast itself. Uh, but go ahead. What were you going to say was the cause of that? Well, I'll give you the chain reaction. I've investigated this extensively and I uh, see it clinically all the time. So as I told you, I looked into these things very deeply, which is why I've been warning women about the very issues we're talking about for a very long time. But here's what happens quite as clearly stated as I can make it. So it's understandable to the uh, lay person, but anything that you do, be it an abdominal corset, which as we both know, a long history of women using those mm -hmm. and and that, killing women that killed women too. 
Yeah, it, it, it's a problem. Uh, I have a whole bunch of literature I've written on that because that correlates also to the use of uh, weight belts in workers and in weightlifters, which is very dysfunctional. And I've written articles about it explaining the entire anatomy and physiology of that. But in a nutshell, here's what happens. Your number one, the one, the number one nutrient you need to keep yourself alive is oxygen. That's why we have to breathe effectively. And number two, the chief alkalinizing mechanism for the blood is oxygen. So when you look at the acidity in the environment and the toxic food people are eating and the amount of sugar, the, the most dangerous thing you can put in your mouth is processed sugar because it begins to acidify your blood immediately. And you cannot correct the breathing rate on anyone eating processed sugar because the body has to hyperventilate to alkalinize the blood. Hmm. There is the brain's constantly monitoring the blood gas ratio between oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen, higher amounts of oxygen stimulate the sympathetic system. Lower amounts of oxygen and higher amounts of carbon dioxide stimulate the parasympathetic system. So whenever a woman wraps their body and constricts breathing by corsets or by bras, the body cannot use the diaphragm properly. So the diaphragm becomes restricted because for the diaphragm to work properly, it has to push the organs down. And many women do not like taking full breaths because it makes their bellies stick out, which is a throw over from the fashion industry, unfortunately. Mm. And so what happens between corsets and bras and tight clothing is they begin to hyperventilate to draw enough oxygen into the body to feed the body's needs for oxygen and, and normalize blood pH, which, as you know, is very tightly regulated or you'll die. Mm -hmm. So anytime there's restriction, there's hyperventilation, which triggers a sympathetic reaction, which elevates adrenaline and cortisol, which counterbalances or antagonizes melatonin and all the growth and anabolic hormones that, grow, that repair and heal the body. So right away, what happens is you set the body up in a fight or flight reaction that is perpetual. And that's why when I saw your studies talking about women wearing bras at night, it shuts down their ability to, to get the normal anabolic response, which includes melatonin, growth mm -hmm. hormone, testosterone, insulin-like growth factor, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. So interesting. it causes a blood gas ratio imbalance. But it also leads to a lot of fearful thinking because when we are switched over to a sympathetic dominance, we go into fight or flight mode and we drop down into our reptilian brain and we start surveying the environment for threats. And that leaves a person who is constantly, consciously or unconsciously, often unconsciously, unconsciously looking for threats in an environment and basically looking constantly to see what kind of threat there is to their health, to their children, whatever, not realizing this is an unconsciously driven reaction because it's a threat to our very survival. So whatever the person's programming is and in, innate fears are from their, pro in other words, if money is a fear or their husband's going to leave them a fear, anything that is an unconscious negative or fear-based driven thought will be significantly magnified by chronic sympathetic activation. And what that does is it, when you study the energetic anatomy of the body, whatever you do to the body, you do to the emotional body, and it has an effect on the mental body. So as a therapist who looks at the emotional anatomy, whenever you constrict the rib cage with a bra, you also constrict the heart chakra and the energetic flow of emotions through the body. If you tie the abdominal wall in there, then you constrict the solar plexus, the sacral chakra, the second chakra, which deals with sex organs and the sacral chakra or the root chakra, which is their connection to safety and security. So what I found unteen million times in my work is that once women start taking bras off and get the right stretching and exercise programs, a lot of their chronic obsessive uh, ADD-like behavior, fearful behavior, negative thinking starts to clear up. And one of the mm. first things I do is have them buy a Swiss ball and lay over the Swiss ball for 15 minutes every morning and every night on their back with their arms up in the air and take slow, deep belly breaths. And that starts helping reverse the thoracic kyphosis, stretch the abdominal muscles, stretch the pectoralis muscles, stretch the scalene muscles. And one of the other big problems we have that ties right into this is this obsession with abdominal crunching and constantly doing exercises that shorten the abdominal wall because that pulls the rib cage down and pulls the head forward and it 
the abdominal muscles are, they get so tight and all these women going to the gym, doing Pilates and all this other constant, you know, bodybuilding and isolation type exercise. And the abdominal muscles are very big muscles. The abdominal wall is a massive collection of, of muscle. And so as it gets shorter and tighter, it basically pulls the head and chest down and causes the same kind of constriction to blood flow and disrupts breathing patterns and adds to it. So mm -hmm. these are the compounding factors that lead to chronic sympathetic elevation and antagonize their body's ability to go into a parasympathetic state. And it's amazing to me because I was just having a conversation with Sarah Gustafson for uh, my podcast, who just put together a brand new women's health course. And we both noticed, and I pointed out that there's all sorts of breathing workshops today where people are doing all sorts of yogic practices and breathing to get into cold water and things like that. But I've had a long string of people that have come from very advanced training and breathing but nobody ever checks their breathing pattern to see if they even can breathe correctly to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, and then if they're wearing if they're wearing a tight belt, um, that's going to interfere with that as well. And you must be against, uh, like I am, um, the all of the um, what do they call it? The, the this con uh, lycra. Well, when they exercise, they like to have like compression garments. Yeah. So they, well, that's that's. That's what I was going to uh, talk to you about because one of the common complaints I get from women, especially if they have you know any size of breast, like any you know big enough to bounce a lot, I've had many women tell me that their boobs start to hurt if they don't wear a tight sports bra, and so. Well, you know, the, the my answer to that it, it, first of it is two things. First, you know, there was a study where they took women who were uh, athletes and they got rid of their bras, and then they preferred actually running bra free. Um, they got comfortable with it and actually preferred that and performed better without a bra. The other thing is, I think one of our cultural assumptions is that everybody should be able to do every activity and your body, you know, if you buy the right equipment, the right clothes, the right, you know, training, everybody should be able to do anything. And I think, you know, you got to be a little smart about it. If you're a, a, an overweight or heavy type person, you probably don't want to go jogging if you don't want to mess up all your joints, your knees, your hips, your feet. I mean, yeah. there's, you know, so in other words, like everything else, it's not one size fits all. If you no. want to exercise and you have big breasts, choose an exercise that isn't so impacting on your body, like swimming, yoga, biking. There's things you can do that aren't bouncing. You don't necessarily want to play tennis. If you do want to play tennis and you need to immobilize your breasts because you're doing a lot of bouncing, okay. Try it with a sports bra, like a jock strap for a man, yeah. um, but take it off as soon as you finish. Don't that's wear exactly, it. Like, that's what you yeah, tell people to. I tell them, I say, look, go ahead and put your sports bra on while you're exercising, but get it off immediately after and know that you're playing a dangerous game because the more tension there is in that bra, and believe me, I've seen sports bras that generate oh, yeah. a lot of tension. Oh well, yeah, they're like they're like binder bras. I mean, they're compressive. They are. And you know, so, by the way, speaking about binder bras, did you know that there is a lot of transsexuals that are getting into binder bras? A lot of women, um, a trans women. No, I guess they'd be trans men that they don't want. These are women who become men, and yeah. they they don't want their breasts to show. So right. they bind them sometimes, or they'll they'll actually get them removed. Um, yeah. But there was a study done on them, and it causes all sorts of health things. Unfortunately, they didn't look at cancer. I guess they didn't have a long enough uh, track record on it. But anyway, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I just wanted to say that before I forgot that there's yeah, yeah. that's no problem. But the, 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 you're you're marching down a path that we need to complete, and that is that there's a lot of. Uh, men becoming women who then start wearing bras to be a woman. So they expose themselves to all the issues that we're talking about within a, you know, a male structure, even though the male orthopedic structure or musculoskeletal system is more robust, light elastic forces are light elastic oh, yeah. forces. Oh, you can yeah. move a tooth in a male with just as little force as you can in a female. And it ca causes all the same effects that I was talking about. Hi everyone, I've searched for over a year now to find a top quality line of CBD products to share with my podcast listeners and subscribers. 
I found that it's very difficult to decipher if you're getting a quality product or something with traces of pesticides, heavy metals, and solvents in it. In my conversations with biodynamic marijuana farming expert Alicia Rose, she made it very clear to me that many of the so-called certified organic marijuana and CBD products on the market are neither certified organic, clean, often having heavy metals and farming chemicals in them, and sometimes have trace amounts of CBD when submitted for lab testing. In other words, there's not much of what they say is in it in it. In my research and testing of about a dozen different companies, I found some that tasted great and several that were pretty good, but I started to get strange symptoms from testing them. For example, the inside of my nose cracked open and was very sore, and I knew it was the CBD products I was testing because nothing else had changed. Fortunately, my good buddy Kyle Kingsbury turned me on to One Farm and their products, and I arranged to have samples of their whole product line sent to my family and I so we could test them. While waiting for the products to arrive, the first thing I did was research their farm and found that all their products are made with the best hemp grown on their USDA certified organic farm in the perfect climate of Longmont, Colorado and extracted without toxic solvents and mixed only with the highest quality ingredients. WAB, which stands for May the Wind Always Be at Your Back, the home of One Farm's CBD production facilities, was founded in January 2017 with the goal of creating the highest quality hemp extract on the market. The staff at One Farm oversee every aspect of production from planting, harvesting, and extracting all the way to bottling. By controlling everything from seed to shelf, One Farm gives you assurance that everything they make is from USDA certified organic hemp, lovingly raised, cultivated, and processed 100% by them in their own facilities. When I received the One Farm products to test, I was immediately impressed. The CBD oil was incredibly pure, and as soon as it hit my tongue, I felt a wave of soothing, relaxing, harmonizing energy flood through my body. And being very sensitive to subtle energies, I knew for sure, immediately, that this was a clean product. Unlike other CBD oils I'd tested, I could feel the One Farm CBD oil dissolving right into my body under my tongue. And, after over a continuous month of use, I've had no negative symptoms and noticed right away that the chronic neck pain I usually have from my stunt lifting accident has been cut down to almost zero and I recover faster from training than on any other supplement I've ever tried for that purpose yet. I encourage all of you to go to https colon forward slash forward slash onefarm.com forward slash check. That's https colon forward slash forward slash onefarm.com forward slash C-H-E-K. Once you're there, click the Explore tab, then the Our Story tab to see the beautiful video footage of their farm, the soil, water and watering system, CO2 extraction, and more. As a sponsor of Living 4D with Paul Check, One Farm generously offers all of you a 15% discount on any purchase by going to https colon forward slash forward slash onefarm.com forward slash check. No discount code is needed. Just follow the link. You'll know you're there because you'll see pictures of me and some of my podcasts featured there and your 15% coupon code will be automatically added to your order. Have a look at their excellent range of CBD oils, beauty products, edibles, and more. As always, One Farm and I would love to hear any feedback you or your pets would like to share. Enjoy. But I tell the women, uh, you know, when you wear a bra like that for running or for athletic activity, your respiratory rate is going up very high, especially if you're in an aerobic dominant sport, such as distance running or lacrosse or soccer. Why why would you want to do that with a tight band around your chest? Well, exactly. So I tell them, look, this is one of the reasons that you've got forward head posture. This is one of the reasons your movement skills are diminished and your uh, your agility is poor and, and you're it, setting yourself up for low back pain and chronic neck pain and a long, long list of other things. So I say, if you're going to do that, then I give them exercises, stretches and mobilizations that they have to do as prophylactic medicine. Hmm. Otherwise, they're going to just get themselves in, in more trouble. In other words, what was a bouncing breast that starts to hurt becomes a body that doesn't move very well and hurts from head to toe. Sure. And, you know, um, 
There's one thing that we, we were talking about before that I want to say, because this is also very relevant. You were mentioning how you've seen obvious lymphedema in the breast because of the bras. And then yes. they take their bras off and the marks don't go away. Well, one right. thing that's really bothering me is thermography. Now, yeah. therm- thermographers, interestingly, pretty much get the bra and breast cancer issue. They see a lot of women's breasts. They see how tight the bras are, how hot they are from the bras. But they have a pr- they don't have any guidelines for a protocol like how long do you take a bra off before you do a thermogram. For many of them, it's five minutes. And so they'll get basically... Um, I mean, I'd like, I'd like thermography because it's like a safe alternative to using radiation, obviously, but right. too much has been given credit to thermograms as if they are really diagnostic tools and they weren't meant to be for the breast. I've spoken actually with a guy who makes thermography machines that are used in breast, in breast, uh, analysis. And he was saying, he thinks that they're, they're pushing it too far. You really can't read in as much as you are. And I've spoken with these guys and it's the newest thing and an alternative medicine. Everybody's like, get a thermogram and all that. But in reality, I don't really trust them. And I think, um, the, especially since what you're seeing is going to be an artifact of bra usage and it, it, you're going to have, you know, how do you, the, the heat of the breast? I know they say, oh, they're comparing now to later and all of this, but I don't know um, if I trust thermography of the breasts when you have a bra issue and they don't address that. Some will have you take the bra off the night before. Most of them don't even think about it and they just five minutes, take off the bra. They assume your breasts have now acclimated to room temperature. You know, when, when in actuality, as you know, even if you drive to a place like that and you have your seatbelt over your breasts, you've already made an impact. In fact, they say, don't even do any massage within like a couple of days of your thermogram. You don't want to push on your breasts or do anything to your breasts because the subtle things, subtle forces are going to change the the temperature issue. And yet the, the bra, which is the most obvious issue on the breast for compression and everything is something they never control for at all. So yeah. I just wanted to make that point because um, those marks don't go away right away. <laughs> they, If you've been wearing a bra all the time and you take it off, it's not like in 10 minutes. Oh, there's, cause that's what this guy told me at a health conference who was giving thermograms to people as he was promoting it at this cancer conference I was at. And I was, you know, I just see how they're, everybody's selling to fear in these industries and they, um, they, it's, it's something I think people should be cautious about. Don't just uh, trust it. Thermography as if it's the be all and end all for everything. It's, it's problematic in my opinion. Well, I don't know. Do you share those, those concerns? Well, a- absolutely. I mean, I've been in this industry a long, long time. I've seen all sorts of technologies come and go. I've used thermography. I've taken courses that trained us on how to use it for diagnostics of spinal pathologies, all sorts of things. So I'm totally hip to it, mm-hmm. but the problem is, is most technicians aren't experts in anatomy, physiology, or human beings. They're just trained to run a machine. They don't mm-hmm. really know enough about what they're doing. So that's one of the key issues. The, the, the you know, there's a, a couple of, of issues that uh, I'd bring up. What what you're talking about is very true. Like I, I told you, I've seen many cases where after an hour therapy session. There was no change in the imprint of the bra, which means there's a serious case of edema. And so when you have that much circulatory stasis and you consider the fact that the lymphatic system is a key system for removing viruses, bacteria, uh, parasites, uh, uh, phagocytes, dead dead tissue that the immune system has immobilized, but it removes dead protein from the body. So when you think of what a compost pile is, it's Mm -hmm. a collection of dead flesh and protein and and fiber. So when a woman's body is trapping the the dead proteins in the waste, it's not only immobilizing the immune antibodies, but it's causing a stagnation of things that attract pathogenic uh, bacteria and virus into the tissue. The other thing is those postural dysfunctions that I cited for you there Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. lead to chronic overload of the uh, intercostal muscles and all the muscles that I mentioned. And there's a fantastic book. I I did years and years of work in physical therapy with repetitive stress injuries, industrial injuries, and workplace injuries. And I studied it quite extensively. And one of my books that's excellent, it's called Occupational Biomechanics Mm -hmm. by Gunnar B.J. Anderson, M.D., 
It's a European book. And they show extensive blood flow studies. And what they showed in analyzing repetitive uh, per- people in the workplace doing repetitive work, that as much as a 5% contraction of a muscle can decrease blood flow through the muscle 50 to 75%. Mm. So when you consider the, the stuff I told you about the increased load as the head moves forward with poor posture and the restriction from the bras and the compression from the bras, you're easily hitting 5% muscle contraction, especially in the scalenes and the intercostals. So you're causing chronic reduction in blood supply, which means reduced oxygen delivery, reduced nutrition delivery, and reduced waste removal, which acidifies the body. And, and I've seen countless cases of women who, when I work through their intercostals, their pec muscles and around their breast tissue, it was like running my fingers through fiberglass. There was so much fibrous mm. tissue in there. And a lot of these women end up diagnosed with fibromyalgia because it's actually uh, it extends itself globally as the problem as one area of the body gets immobilized, other areas of the body start overreacting to compensate. And next thing you know, they burn out. Mm-hmm. And so the, when you let this chain reaction run on for several years, you, you get basically a global stress reaction that leads to mm-hmm. uh, constriction and decreased circulation and chronically elevated adrenaline and cortisol, which leads to adrenal burnout, which then causes massive shifts in the balance of the hormonal system. And basically, you get what we called in the military a SNAFU. Are you familiar with that term? No, I'm not. It's an acronym for situation normal, all fucked up. (laughs) It's called a SNAFU. So you have a SNAFU body, which Mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. you know, I tell people anytime a physician uses the term syndrome in a diagnosis, it means I don't know what the hell's going on. Exactly. Something's fucking wrong. You know, it's another interesting thing that, and they, there's recent studies, by the way, all this lymphatic stuff has been known since the 1930s. In fact, I found Mm -hmm. for my, my update on the book that Dr. John Mayo, who started the Mayo Clinic, he yeah. wrote in the 1930s about how breast cancer is only a problem in, in cultures where the breasts are um, irritated and compressed with clothing. So they yeah. already knew that. They knew lymph stasis caused cancer and was they, they knew this stuff, but they forgot it. They even knew it in the 1800s when they were associating certain cancers with, with the corsets as they started to engulf the breasts more. They, they, doctors, that's why they were dress reform, uh, health reformers who tried getting rid of the corset. Uh, but of course, it became the bra and then there was breast binding of the, um, uh, in the 30s with the uh, flappers, and they wanted to look very boyish, so they had very tight bras. And doctors back then knew it was causing um, breast cancer, uh, so it's it's really not a surprise. All of these things that we're talking about. Um, what's the surprise is that it's not discussed in our culture. I mean, we think of ourselves as an advanced, intelligent culture. And this information we're talking about, there is research for everything that we're saying. And even the cancer connection, there was a study in Harvard in 1991 that I didn't know about. I was doing my research at that time. And I was told about this by the media after my book came out. Um, they, I, was, I was getting really good media in the beginning. This is in 1995. It, it, the, the issue was... Um, my publisher um, was like one of the major alternative health publishers, Avery, Avery, they were taken over by Penguin Putnam, but they were really good back then. And uh, we had good coverage, but the the medical industry was just, and the bra industry were really resisting this and not wanting to talk about it. But I got a call from NPR telling me this, they were doing a story on stories that they missed over the year at the end of the year. And they, they still didn't cover this because they just can't. Um, mainstream is choking on this because of the corporate interests. But he told me, you know, there's support for your study. And there was this Harvard study that found in premenopausal women half the rate of breast cancer if they were bra free. So yeah. wearing a bra doubled the rate. And uh, they they um, that study, then there was my study, and then studies started to come out and there were new bras being patented based on Dress to Kill, based on our book, trying to be better to lymphatics, um, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, but recently 
there and there were studies even in Brazil in 2016. Now there was a study in Brazil called "Wearing." The title of this study, which is peer-reviewed study, says "Wearing Type Bras for Long Hours Daily Increases Breast Cancer Risk." So they directly studied it, and the the author of that study told me she was having a tremendously hard time getting it into any peer-reviewed journal. If it has bras and breast cancer in the title, they don't like it. There was only and so there have been now about 30 studies on breast cancer and bras that are supportive, most of them coming out of Southeast Asia. Um, they're discovering their breast cancer rates are skyrocketing as they wear bras 24-7 now. They're very compliant cultures out there, and they're, try- they're westernized now. Before they were westernized, breast cancer was rare. Now, un- unless they wore binders of some sort, like in the past. But um, now that they're wearing bras, again, their breast cancer rates are skyrocketing, and it's new enough in their culture that they could see we didn't have this problem before and now we're dressing like this. So they're putting it together there and they're realizing, and they know for sure sleeping in a bra definitely increases breast cancer risk. And these other, but there was one study. This is interesting because if, you know, if, if people are going to research this, they're going to go online and they're going to run into the the misinformation that's designed to keep this out of public. uh, Yes. It's called called Google. (laughs) Yeah. What they've so this I was going to tell you. I started this discussion to tell you that there's a new study, and this is on my website, brasandbreastcancer.org, where there these are dermatologists not looking at breasts per se, but they found that if you interfere with the lymphatics by a surgical scar, you increase cancer in that area. And they they there's a part by there are um, immunocompromised areas of the body that get that way by scar tissue from surgical scars. So when you have any type of surgery, you're going to increase cancer rate simply by damaging the lymphatics. And they're recognizing that now. So you imagine, and I think the whole world of lymphatics is going to explode as more and more people are getting lymphedema from all these uh, from from cancers and the lymph node removal that they do to try to stop the spread and it creates this lymphedema uh, culture that we have now and all the products with that and um, but I was uh, I diverged and I think I'm forgetting where I was going to go with this because oh I was telling you that the the yeah there was one study this is it there was one study that they came out with that was funded by the National Cancer Institute and it was deliberately designed to discredit the bra and breast cancer link and because they they had to come up with something because the public was getting more this is growing every year more and more people and being bra free is now acceptable it's no longer culturally taboo for the younger generation to be bra free and they have this thing called free the nipple movement where they they want equality with men and there are many places where you know men can go with their nipples exposed why can't women be top free and there are many places where they can now including new york city and a lot of a lot of uh, states have been dealing with this issue, issue of women wanting to not they want to be equal to men why are their breasts automatically sexualized i mean if in our culture if men sexualize their breasts theoretically men shouldn't be able to be top free but apparently men's breasts okay women's breasts not we've got to cover them um so they did this uh the culture is is um it, it, it has to try to deny the brown breast cancer leak. So I found they, they went to Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center. This is uh, in Washington, and it's very respected because the mainstream goes there whenever they want to study to prove what they want. When, when there was a link between uh, antiperspirants and cancer, um, they, the Fred Hutchison came out with a study that said no. All right. So They were then able to, medicine was then able to say, well, a study came out that said no, so that's the end of the issue. Now, first of all, one study doesn't say anything, and there's always contradictory studies in medicine. That's the nature of research. You do more. You never close the subject with one study like, okay, it's been debunked or whatever. But with the brown breast cancer issue, they still needed a study, so they did one. And they they used postmenopausal women because the Harvard study that I mentioned before that looked at premenopausal women, they didn't find this bra effect in postmenopausal women in that study. So instead of trying to look at the interesting one, which is, wow, premenopausal women have a higher rate of breast cancer if they wear bras. They should have looked at premenopausal women. So instead to confirm that bras don't cause cancer or try to confirm that, they looked at postmenopausal, which introduces a survivor bias, 
um, that you, you can't bias your re- just looking at a group that survived the cancer because maybe they don't wear bras as tightly or there's something about this group that a lot of women died younger from breast cancer because of their bras, but we're not going to look at them because they're younger than 55. So they're only looking at like lifetime smokers. You could find people in their 90s who still smoke and they somehow made it. And if we looked at old smokers, you might think smoking isn't bad for you. And that's what they did. They looked at old bra users and none of them were bra free. So there was no control group. So this is like very bad research, right? And it was done by a graduate student. So there was an easy fall person if they had to. Uh And the conclusion, and, and this, Fred Hutchinson gets money every year from a 5K bra dash. They have people dress in bras and run for to raise money for this cancer place. So they use bras as a fundraiser. And here they come up with a conclusion, and they called me before they published, and they wanted to get my reaction um, because this is all propaganda. They want to know what I'd say so they could spin it. And they, uh, I said, why did you only you know, use postmenopausal when the only study that you're even c- quoting, which they say is flawed, they had to say that was flawed because it showed cancer rising with bra usage, but it was in pre, not postmenopausal. Why would you only use postmenopausal? And their answer was, well, if it's a lifestyle thing, the longer it's done, the the worse the effect would be. So we'd expect older women, if this was true, they would have it the worst because of the bra. But actually, that's completely wrong and shows a real lack of understanding of epidemiology, which is kind of concerning. Um, because they had introduced a selection by a survivor bias. And if you look that up, it'll explain it. Um, I you know, know what it is. Yeah. You can't, like, if we looked at 90 year old smokers, I want to look at smoke, you know, we could find a group and exclude non smokers and then look at the smokers and ask, is there a difference between those who smoke two packs a day or one pack a day for their whole life until they were 90? or maybe three and two. And then if you don't find a big difference, the conclusion is smoking doesn't seem to affect the lungs and lung cancer. That's what they did with this bra study. They looked at differences that they wear at 11 hours or 13 hours or 15 hours, and they had really weird categories for their time. And then they didn't find a difference. So th- the way they used it, I'm sure they manipulated it just right. They And they didn't have any control group. And, and then they, this was announced around the world as the final word on the bra and breast cancer link. It's been debunked and so forth. Then Gwyneth Paltrow, who has... A doctor, Sedegi, his name is Habib Sedegi. He's her personal physician. He wrote, I, I never met him before, uh, this, what I'm going to about to tell you. Um, he wrote an article for Goop, which is Gwyneth Paltrow's um, wellness big thing that everybody likes to beat her up for because she says all these uh, allegedly crazy alternative things, right? So he wrote this article, Do Bras, Do Underwire Bras. Um, and by the way, we never differentiated underwire or non-underwire. I think tight is tight. Well, we're we're going to we're, we're gonna, we're gonna get to that issue. So okay. let's save that. Okay. So he wrote, do they cause breast cancer? And he had a good article where he took a lot of my stuff, you know, from the internet, including the, this, this study in uh, Fred Hutchison that said no link. And, but he took the other studies that, that showed a link and he's saying, this is very plausible and this and that and the other thing. And um, as a result of that, there were articles all over the internet calling him a quack, um, calling Gwyneth, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow uh, a quack, and just blasting this guy. And you know he was he was just de- he was um, uh, defamed all over the internet. He and Gwyneth Paltrow for saying resurrecting this this uh, how do they like de- uh, debunked. Um, myth of bras and breast cancer. And I called him uh, just thinking, I, I got to congratulate this guy for taking the heat on this and being willing to even talk. That's why I contacted you, Paul. Um, you know, I, I, I find it on the, I, I want to congratulate people for being willing to say the truth and have an open mind in a culture that is completely closed minded and is going to crucify you if you go against the status quo. So I contacted him. He was almost in tears. He took my call. He, I said, you know, you're really brave for doing this. I really appreciate you. He said, you know, I never thought this would happen. They're threatening my license. They're, people are attacking me all over the place for, for just simply saying we should think about this and look at it and do more research. I mean, he wasn't even being definitive. He put it in a question format. 
And just the mere mention of it was enough to elicit an immune response from the culture to keep this thing down. We cannot have this information out there. So I ended, I ended up asking him to write the forward for my new edition, which he did, to describe how he was dealt with on this issue to show. My, and my publisher wrote uh, something for this one too. In the first one in 1995, it's actually it's the same publisher, the same man. He, uh, he got bought out and then he started a new company called Square One Publishers and he, he's published my second edition. And when he first published it in 1995, uh, before it came out and he announced it in Publishers Weekly, he got um, contacted by the Intimate Apparel Council. That's the trade association for the brown industry. They told they told him I didn't attend schools that I that I did attend. They uh, you know so they tried to defame me, and they threatened him with a lawsuit if he would publish. And he said, "Go ahead, I'd love the publicity." And <laughs> good man, yeah. And he and he <laughs> and we went ahead with it, and it's been an uphill battle ever since then. And I went around the world with the book, just warning women. I'd go, I'd fly to a place. I didn't care if the book was there. I mean, I don't. When you discover something like this is so empowering and important to try to let women know. I mean, it's a choice you have as a woman, whether you want to wear a bra or not, it doesn't, it should have a warning label on it. And it should tell you, don't wear it over 12 hours a day. Make sure it doesn't leave red marks, you know, things to tell you how to wear it. It tells you how to wash the damn thing, but doesn't tell you how to wear the damn thing. So women are in the dark about this. And I wanted to warn them that this exists. There should be more research. So I went around the world, literally, to like New Zealand, Australia, flew to England, just whatever I could to talk. And I was on major news, national, all over the place with doctors saying this should be ignored. This is ridiculous. There's no evidence. And that became their mantra for over these years. Then somebody like two, about over 10 years ago, 15 years ago, started a Wikipedia page on Dress to Kill and has been using that ever since to beat up the concept. And they won't allow, the editors for that are very high up in Wikipedia and they won't allow any edits that are positive about the book. They won't even describe the results of the book anymore. They took that out. They describe instead the study that that de- that says the book what it didn't uh, that they that when I told you about in Hutchison they describe that in detail they don't allow any citations of references to other studies nothing it's like a hit piece and even the things that they refer to aren't even real um, it's it's incredible the way the system works um, I'll give you another example of something there was a website I I would sometimes if I see a website that says bras and breast cancer is a myth. And it's usually promoted by usually like, I think the American Cancer Society or Coleman, those two are really in denial of this because I don't know how they're going to explain that for 25 years, they've been, they've been denying this link as even possible or even worthy of research. I mean, they've been saying, we don't even want to look at it. It was hard for them to do that Hutchison study because it implied that this is a legitimate concept. If they do research onto, into something, it's implicitly a concept that should be looked at. They don't even want to legitimate it. So the reason they did the study, they said, was because the internet is rife with misinformation suggesting bras cause breast cancer. So they want to set the record straight once and for all with this study that we're going to do to show you how it should be. That's that's how they did it. They didn't say, oh, this is an important question that needs research. Um, so anyway, that's the way they've been dealing with this this whole thing. Um, was I about to, I was going to tell you another story about, um, but I'm going on too much with my stories. I got to give you a chance. So, uh, unless no. you want me to keep on going with it, cause the politics well, I, has been I've mind got, blowing. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally with you. I've been the, uh, I've been at the, uh, opposite end of the gun barrel a thousand times in my life. Uh, I've pioneered a lot of stuff. But anyhow, Sid, I think those are all excellent uh, points you've made, and I can feel your passion. I can feel your concern. One of the things that you know I think is important to state right here is that you're you're dealing with an issue because of your training, your background, your understanding, and your experience with the issue, and your clear awareness that this is a real threat to women's not only their health but their life. A lot of women die from breast cancer. This is really a moral imperative, and a moral is a code of conduct that is life affirmative. So it's immoral for anybody, 
be it a doctor or otherwise, that identifies a real threat to our survival or a human being's survival to not make the public aware of it. And so really what that boils down to is that all the medical resistance to even looking to this is an act of immorality. Mm -hmm. It's, it's actually, oh, yes. it's, it's really, uh, unfortunately it's the medical mafia's ethics and an ethics, an ethic is a code of conduct that may or may not be moral. I tell people when I was a paratrooper in the 82nd airborne division, I had a very comprehensive soldier's manual that told me who to kill, who not to kill and what you were not allowed to do with them if you captured them as a prisoner. But it was an ethical manual. It wasn't a moral manual. The moral manual is is simply this. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's a moral. It means protect life. So we, we have a real issue of immorality, not only in medicine, but in science. You, all you got to do is look at all the drugs and things that have been backed by science that killed countless thousands of people, only later to be have to recall after 20, 30,000 people or more are dead. That's because they're science has a real problem with morality. They think, oh, it's not our job to worry about what happens. We just invent shit like microwave ovens and 5G wireless systems and, uh, you know, a long, long list of dangerous stuff that, that uh, is out there that the medical community, if it was doing its job, would immediately put under scientific scrutiny. Well, you know, part of the problem there is that in our culture, the, the, this is the culturogenic nature. You're speaking about cultural factors. You see, it's not just mm. lifestyle. It's, no. it's, the, it's these things too. Um, in our culture, because it's capitalist, we uh, or partially capitalist, we want to promote industries and not squash them with some sort of um, a principle that if we first we have to test these things to see if they're harmful before we allow it to be out there. I mean, that would be prudent. That would be a precautionary principle type of a thing. Like, you know, if there's, we have to first prove it's safe before we release this new technology. Uh, and that's not the way our culture works. Our culture is release the technology. And if there are problems that come up, we'll deal with it afterwards. And that's, so we don't want to squash new development. We don't want to stop, you know, 5G because it, even if it's going to cause more brain cancer, what we'll end up doing is we'll have 5G and then medicine will come up with new ways to detect brain cancer and try to treat it. They, they, they come up with detection and treatment of the problem rather than trying to with wisdom and you really don't know sometimes what's going to happen but you know to think beforehand do we really want as a culture to change and allow this new product or this new thing to enter our lives what might this do to us what might but if you did that nothing would ever change we'd be still in the stone age you know because everything affects you know you don't know all the impacts and everything changes the status quo to some degree that's going to be disruptive but to some degree you know there's good and bad to everything so i i hear what you're saying and i completely agree with you but I'm, i try to understand where that's coming from that you know we are a profit driven culture medicine is a business like any other they make money when you're sick therefore they have a conflict of interest implicit in medicine that they, if, if you're sick, you come, if you're not sick, if you could prevent disease, you'd never have to go to a doctor. I mean, I thought what we really need is a new, I mean, if I, if I was young again and able to uh, actually, I don't even know if, if I could ever accomplish this. This is one of my dreams that I don't think will ever happen, but I think applied medical anthropology, which is what I'm practicing and pioneering. It's applied because it's to a specific problem and it's medical anthropology because I'm looking at how the culture affects your health. And if, if we, we should really go to an anthropologist before you go to your doctor, you should go to a medical anthropologist and say, what am I doing wrong? And that would include training in the things that you know. Like, yeah, look how you're, you're on your iPhone all the time. You're going to, you know, I'm watching you. I see why your neck is hurting you. You're not going to necessarily realize this yourself, even though when you, when you point it out to people, it'll be obvious. Like, you know, why, why are my breasts sore? Well, let's look at your bra. It's very tight, isn't it? Well, yeah, I never thought about it. You, why, you know, it's, it's obvious stuff. Look how you're sitting. Look how you're working. Look at the stress in your life. Look how unhappy you are. 
if you looked at your life and saw all the problems and how that's impacting on your health, your stress and, and everything is all related, you could eliminate so much disease by removing those lifestyle causes and allowing your body to heal like it's supposed to and, and operate optimally. So ideally, before you went to a doctor for a medical intervention, because they're only going to give you medicine or surgery. If you go to a chiropractor, they'll give you an adjustment, maybe some diet stuff. If you go to, you know, any specialist you go to, they'll give you their specialty. You know, a Chinese medicine guy will give you that. So if you went to an anthropologist first and you got all the crap out of your life that you can, you have a choice over, get rid of the tight clothing, change the way you're, you know, you're sleeping. We did research on head of bed elevation, how important that is for brain circulation. So you should be sleeping on an adjustable bed or something to hit your head up. Um, th- we've done studies that causes migraines and glaucoma and sleep apnea. They've already done studies on some of those things, but we figured it out and connected with a whole bunch of diseases, circulatory problems because of gravity and being too low when you're sleeping. So these are lifestyle things that we don't even think about the effect of you look in a physiology textbook and see if you can find the word gravity in there. And yet gravity is so important in our circulation and we're horizontal and vertical at different times of the day, whether we're standing or sleeping or sitting and all of that uh, gravity is pulling down and it's affecting circulation. And if, and so you'll never see that discussed in medicine. You'll never see clothing discussed and tight clothing. Clearly, if you are, if you are a toxicologist and you're worried about poisons getting out of uh, getting into the body and out of the body you'd be concerned about circulation within the body to allow these drugs that you're taking that you know you take um like chemotherapy if you took chemotherapy for ovarian cancer and you're wearing a bra what will happen is the chemo goes into your body the whole body all your tissues and then has to be flushed out by the lymphatics but the bra is going to keep the breasts from flushing properly. So it will be delivered, the, the, the poison will be delivered by the bloodstream under the pressure of the capillary, the, under the pressure of the bloodstream. And the capillaries will, will deliver it because they have pressure in them. But the lymphatics won't be able to drain it because of the pressure of the bra. So what ends up happening is you get toxified breasts. They, they experience toxins more than a bra-free breast that could flush out like the rest of your body. So one of the causes of breast cancer, which we should have mentioned before, is the toxins you know the, the, that are in our polluted air, food, and water, and medications. And many of these are carcinogens. And even radiation damage. All of these things have to be cleansed and removed from the tissues. And if you're wearing anything tight, that part of the body that's constricted has lymph impairment and immune impairment. So that part of the body is going to get sick in one way or another. It's going to be toxic. It's going to be edematous. It's going to be hypoxic. It's going to, you know, if it, it, it's just anything tight. Inter- anoxic as well. Anoxic, yes. And, and, and that means you can't fight free radicals if there's damage. All, your whole immune system breaks apart. This, you know, the lymphatics are the circulatory pathway of your immune system. I learned more about it in biochemistry grad school than in medical school because in, in medicine, they, they can't do much to them except cut them out. There's no drug for the lymphatics. They can't surgically do much to them. They're tiny. All they do is destroy them whenever they cut your body and they remove them because this, they see disease spreading that way. Well, first of all, you know, without going there, the point is that's your immune system. You remove that. It doesn't come back and you're going to have lymphedema the rest of your life, which is terrible and uncurable. And it's, and it's all caused by this ignorance about the way our bodies work that medicine ignores. Yeah. Now there's several things I wanted to point out. So I'm going to loop back a little bit, but, um, I got some good news for you, Sid. Oh, there's about 15,000 Czech professionals all over the world trained to look at everything you've just described that you're ascribing to uh, medical anthropologists for which I could probably put all of them in a small uh, conference room. Uh, everybody that comes through my system is trained in everything that you heard me talk about and most of the things that you're talking about. And that's what a Czech holistic lifestyle coach does. They have very elaborate screening systems, very comprehensive questionnaires. 
to identify everything you've been talking about and teach people natural holistic approaches. And it's an integrative system that teaches you how to refer, cross refer to as many as 20 different types of health and medical professionals. So essentially, I am, I've devoted my life to doing what you're describing needs to be done. So wow. that's the good news for you. That's ex- excellent. I'm really glad to hear that. I've spent my whole life researching this. That's why I told you I have a very big library and anybody that's come in here is usually shocked at the amount of not only books that I have, but rare medical books, awesome books from the the 50s and 60s before they were uh, corporate scientists were corporate prostitutes. That's the problem. Science science has now become the largest uh, prostitution ring. They'll they'll produce results to say anything you want for the right amount of money. Exactly. And the other thing is I've got a friend who's an FDA agent. He's told me personally that he's busted many medical doctors for writing up bogus research studies to support various drugs that were actually never done, but are published in peer reviewed journals and believed as fact by medical doctors. And that's happening all the time. Well, I know it is. And, and, and recently in the news, um, I've been, um, you know, vaccines are really in the news and it's really interesting. There was a study that came out last week. Uh, we're talking now in January, 2020, that said that the HPV uh, vaccine for human papillomavirus mm-hmm. that that is touted as this wonderfully working thing. It's perfect. They want to give it to kids, to boys, to everybody. I mean, I'm surprised they don't just shoot it into fetuses in utero just to get it in there. Well, just give them a few minutes. Yeah. You know what? This study said that there's no proof that it works. They, it was yeah. It was a big um, meta-analysis that took all these studies and they found that the endpoints weren't even cancer prevention. They had surrogate endpoints that they looked for like a marker that suggested it worked, but they, they weren't even seeing if their cancer rates went down. They didn't know that. They weren't giving it to the target group of people, which were young people. They gave it to older people. So they, they didn't check whether sexual behavior changed over that period of time that would have affected the rates. It's In other words, the this research they said the research on HPV is completely inconclusive has been very poorly done, and you know you can't conclude it even works. No, you know if if you listen to my interview with Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, who's one of the world's most highly esteemed experts in vaccination, she absolutely annihilates the entire concept, gives the entire history of it. And that podcast is my most listened to podcast, and it made headline news five times, three times in Australia and two times in England in major newspapers, and almost got a friend of mine fired from his job for sharing that on his uh, Instagram channel. Uh, But I have addressed that issue thoroughly, uh, and and so my listeners are pretty hip to, to that whole debacle. Well, the point I'm making is at the same time that that came out, it was, com- I found it on med, on uh, med page, um, this, this like service anyway, um, uh, it's a free thing. They send me headlines. It wasn't in anything else on the internet, nowhere else. All that was elsewhere were these statements that HPV virus is works and it's perfect. And new studies have come out confirming that it works. I contacted the, the author of the study that said it, they, they don't work. And I said, I sympathize with you because, um, I see how, you know, you're ignored and all is coming out is that the vaccine is great. And she responded and said, yeah, it's very difficult. And she appreciates my understanding how she feels after all the work they put in. It's, it's ignored. If you're lucky yeah. enough to get it into a peer-reviewed journal, this was in the the journal of the Royal Academy of Science, something, it's like a very prestigious thing. But in the meantime, in, in Lancet was something saying, a, a study last year that said, hey, the, the, the vaccine works. Of course, that study would have been criticized in this other paper for not really being a good study. Um, so yeah, that's only one example. I mean, they, the, the whole thing about sugar where they in the 60s, some Harvard professors were paid by the sugar industry. This was, this came out last year. They were paid by the sugar industry to write an article that that condemned fats and cholesterol and said sugar is okay. And that, that set up decades of people avoiding eggs and cholesterol and the whole cholesterol stuff. All the stuff about fats are bad, sugar is good. That came from the sugar industry by paying off Harvard 
professors who were well respected, who then put it out there. That's their opinion, and then medicine follows. Because most of the people in medicine, they don't think for themselves. They're all. It's a very authoritarian structure, as you know. And if your authority says it, you don't question it, or you're in a lot of trouble. And that's, yeah, that's, very- that's the it's brainwashing and prostitution. It's prostitution, prostitution. But listen, a definition of a culture is a bunch of people doing the same thing. And I don't think you need more than two brain cells holding hands to look around at the rates of chronic disease, the rate of the rates of suicide in every category. Oh, yeah. the, 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 the fact of the matter is we are destroying the entire environment while we're destroying ourselves. And all of this is approved by fucking science. So, well, you know, uh, science. You I know, think I think you need to differentiate between science. I'd hate for people to go back to the dark ages. I mean, I'm running into people who are saying the Earth is flat. Okay, and, no, I'm not. I'm not anti-science. I'm yeah. anti-bullshit science. I, well, I I base my whole goddamn living on science. I got a library full of science. That's why I said I have a lot of medical books from the 50s and earlier because then scientists were actually in the honest pursuit of truth well, not to get a paycheck. Well now they're doing also advocacy science. I mean it won't even necessarily be for a paycheck. It could be for a political cause. And that's what that's another interesting um what was the article that came out they said oh yeah, red meat. Recently they came out with a, a big it hit the headlines that a study a big meta analysis came out and said red meat isn't bad for you. I mean, it, all these years, we've been told red meat, bad, processed meat, bad. It raises your rates of heart disease and all this. They, could f- they couldn't find it. They did a big analysis and they said, no, red meat isn't so bad for you after all. And then I was, I was seeing the response to that because it was a real embarrassment to all the people in the big, all the experts were embarrassed again, just like they're embarrassed about bras. How are these experts? I mean, the number one responsibility of an expert is to maintain his expert status. That's all they want. They want to keep their status. If they admit that they were wrong, they lose it. So they have to keep their position. It's an ego thing. It's a financial thing. You're dealing with people. And if you're the expert and you've been saying all your life, this is the case and something comes up and says it isn't, very few people, I would, I, I'm into truth. You know, I'm I'm happy to be proven wrong because that makes me more correct. I'm wanting to always accumulate more wisdom and knowledge. I'm not ever closed to where I could be wrong because I'm looking to be corrected. But most people who have a position to worry about, they're not like that. They defend themselves. They don't want to be wrong. And people, um, another thing we should talk about is about people being wrong about wearing bras. They don't want to blame the victim. That's another big thing. Medicine is saying we don't want to t- one of the reasons is they don't want women to feel they did it to themselves because then they feel really bad. So it bl- it's like blaming the victim and saying it's your fault. You wore the bra. It really isn't their fault. It's the culture's fault. But anyway, th- that's, that's part of the resistance um, that people have. They, they don't want to admit fault. They don't want to admit they were wrong. But here was a study that came out that was about um, meat, and the people who were saying you shouldn't eat meat and been saying it all along had to justify themselves, and they were saying we we don't we don't want to say meat is good because it's destroying the environment. Meat consumes more of this, and they gave a global warming thing. So here you have what what's what's really happening: public policy is being created not based on science, but based on values and um, isms <laughs> isms yes and on goals that they have that may not have anything to do with anything else uh, but if they could if they could have a study that they if if meat is good then people are going to eat more meat and it's going to destroy the environment so if we want to save the environment we got to let people think meat is bad so they won't eat so much and if these studies say it's bad i'm in favor of them if this study says no it isn't bad i'm against that study so what happens is whether or not the study is good or bad never really matters you agree with it if it supports your bias, and you disagree with it if it goes against your bias. And that's called the belief system. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what that is. And, it, and you know, my comment said about science, which I think you misunderstood a little bit. I am very concerned about the complete bastardization and destruction of science, and scientists yes. themselves should be. I am totally into science, but it has to be done legitimately, and it has to be done in pursuit of the truth. And you have to be willing to face the dragon of realizing that you're wrong 
And when you're making millions and billions and trillions of dollars by promoting ideas that make you money but could be destructive to society and to the planet itself, then you have prostitution and there you have evil inside of science. And and I am right. really, really concerned that we are destroying science and we are destroying medicine and we're destroying the environment. And our culture is now becoming a culture where it's normal to be full of cancer. It's normal to be obese. It's normal to be sick. It's normal but, to be tired. But you know, an, another pro I agree with everything you're saying. And another problem of this is that because we can't trust science, I mean, science is really in its pure form is simply an organized way of, of gathering information and trying to understand the world. It, it, yes. And it's, it's an investigative strategy. It's yes. an investigative structure system. It's, it's a system of honest investigation. It's like logic or something like that. It's just being applied by people who are not honest, who are propagandists or who have agendas and who hide information if it isn't what they want, because there's money at stake. And that, that trumps science. I mean, science as an honest pursuit, I don't know if it ever really existed. It would have to be by somebody that had absolutely nothing to gain by the results. Pure questioning like, what, gee, I wonder what would happen. I have no investment in the outcome. But that's never the case. There's, it has to be funded by somebody. So the funding of the science is, is what, you know, that if you're a scientist and you want grants, you want to please your grant, the guy who's giving you the grants. You don't want to prove that their drug is going to kill people. And if you did, they probably, they have the right to not publish it. So, you know, you end up saying what they want because you want to get your grants. And if you are in a good position because you're like, have great credentials, no one's going to be able to question you. And when it comes to the media, I've run into, I was going to tell you this story about I would see sometimes these statements that are mis misinformation, but they're calling it, they're calling the brown breast cancer link a myth. I mean, that, that connects with your whole, we don't know what to trust anymore. What is truth has become so perverse, not just, and the fake news stuff is being used against things like bras and breast cancer. I just saw in Italy, they have um, a website I mean, the whole bunch of articles coming out on small websites trying to say bras and breast cancer is, is a myth because I think a lot of Italians are catching on. Um, I mean, the book is coming out in all sorts of languages and it's around the world for years now and it's really been affecting the bra industry. I mean, that's why when you look at bras, there are so many non-underwire, softer bras. They say more comfortable and all this. I mean, that's because of our efforts in, in pointing this out. Because when we started, it was all underwires, very uncomfortable, and push up, and, and now it's like bralettes that are almost like a t-shirt, nothing, and women are they're getting the message. Um, but as this, um, gee, I forgot where I was going with that. Well, what I want to, while you're uh, enjoying your brain fart, there, I'm going to interject. <laughs> You know, you've used the word myth several times, yeah, and you've used going. it, and in, in you've used it in an, an association with, you know, it's a, a myth that your bra can be damaging to you, etc. But most people in our culture don't understand what the word myth really means. They think myth means a lie, but the real meaning of myth is something that never happened, but is happening all the time. <sighs> Um, okay. Well, that's a different interpretation of oh. that word than I think they mean when they say these are 10 myths. Well, that's not, yes, but that's yeah. not the point. I'm making a very important point. Look at your own statement. They're saying that your research and the issue of breasts causing women health problems is a myth. I'm saying a myth is something that never happened i.e. they're saying the bras were never a problem, but it's happening all the time. They're getting sick all day mm -hmm. long. That's what a myth is. A myth is not something that you can objectively quantify. By definition, a myth is a story to try to explain something that we don't have the science to understand. A very simple way to look at this. The entire construct of scientific materialism and the scientific materialist cosmology, what we call cutting-edge cosmology and modern science, is all based on the concept of the Big Bang. But they don't know what caused the damn thing. They don't know anything behind that point, but they build this ideology that says this is actual fact. Well, your first premise is you don't know what the mm -hmm. fuck happened. Mm -hmm. And while they're doing that, they're denying religion and denying mythology, which all deals with the mystery. And that's why worship is so 
important because we don't really know where we all came from. We don't know if it was the Big Bang or the nine millionth or trillionth or billionth Big Bang or an infinite series of Big Bangs. But the point I'm making is we construct these illusions and call it science and call it fact when even in the highest levels of science, if you look at their very basis of their own foundation, it starts with an illusion, with a mystery, yeah. and that is the Big Bang. Well, it's all based. It's no. all based on theories and assumptions, and ultimately, you can't question your assumptions because you're building on them until something cataclysmically changes your worldview, and that's we have a paradigm shift. And think about, and that's where we're we're headed. That's right now. Yeah. We we don't have a choice. We either change our paradigm quick, or we. Are, we are. We will fulfill the sixth mass extinction out of stupidity. But paradigms, you know, don't change. It's not a rational thing. You're dealing with humans. Humans are not rational. Yeah. They rationalize. You know, yes. they they rationalize things to fit their biases. They're not rational animals. Like I'm always going to be thinking logically and in self interest and doing the right thing. No, it's like I want this. My feelings tell me that I'm going to figure out a reason to justify that. And that's how we are. We're pretty, uh, you know, messed up creatures. And I, well, that this, yeah, the, sorry, yeah. Th this goes right back to where science came from. Sure. Science originally was called natural philosophy. What we call science today emerged from the field previously called natural philosophy. Philosophy, by definition, is the study of wisdom, the love of wisdom. Philosophia means love of wisdom. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is we've lost the connection between philosophy and science, and therefore we no longer have a love of wisdom. We have a love of selling shit at any cost. Sure. So we need to remarry philosophy because mythology is very tied to philosophy because philosophy itself is full of schools that oppose each other. But when you look at nature, nature can't survive without diversity. You look at farming. As soon as you get rid of diversity and start monocropping, you destroy the soil, you destroy the environment, and you destroy the people eating the food. And you end up having to use a bunch of chemicals to compensate for the parasites and all the uh, mm -hmm. infestations that come from throwing nature into an imbalance because you've lost the understanding of the philosophy of the wisdom of nature. And now you think that with some chemicals and a few scientific gadgets, you can trick mother nature into doing what you want her to do so we really have to look at well what is the love of the wisdom of the human body well for millions of years we were running around without bras on and so if we just say okay let's just look at this thing logically and 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 for you and and, and from an anthropological point of view and then from a common sense point of view and then say okay now let's do some legitimate research into this and as your book states and as your website states there's ample evidence to say, hey, look, you don't need to be a genius to understand basic physiology. You cut off the circulation to the breast, you restrict the rib cage, and all the things we've just talked about, you got fucking problems. Yeah. And any scientist that goes against that has his head so buried up his fourth point of contact that all he can see is his paycheck. Well, you know, and this is that's the story I was going to tell you, though, that's is really revealing about how our culture is so authoritarian. I was I there, there would be like a website that would say this statement about bras. And one of them says it's certified by this particular like uh, organization that, that certifies information as accurate and true. And I contacted them and I said, this statement that you're certifying is wrong. And what they did was they set me up with the people making that statement. And this statement was used by the National Cancer Institute. And it says in one sentence, you know, that bras, uh, that there is no link between antiperspirants, bras, and breast cancer. They just like one sentence with no other explanation that there's no link, that, that it doesn't do anything. So I said, no, it does. Here's all these studies. You can't say it doesn't. You could say more research is needed. Some studies suggest it does. One study says it doesn't. Um, but if you, it, it needs more research. They, it ends up, what they did was they set me up to talk with the people making the statement which is this big scholarly um, business that they make, they make statements for different industries. Like, you know, they'll research it for you and, and they'll like certify it. And well, the certifier was a third party, but the third party certifier only made me talk to these people. And I explained my thing. Then they decided that they weren't going to change a thing. And that was the end of it. And I contacted the certifier. I said, 
you're certifying this is accurate and it's not even accurate. They said, we don't, we don't look at the information ourselves. The way we certify it is by, we make sure that they have to deal with your objection and however they deal with it, we're satisfied. But they, that's, yes, right. so that's, that's the cert, so much for certification of truth. Another thing that would happen is if like a news, ABC, CBS, whatever, they'll have during breast cancer awareness month, they have all their bullshit out there from the cancer industry. And they'll say, oh, 10, five myths about bra, about breast cancer. And one of them is bras. And I'll contact the station and some, um, more than half the time, I'll tell them, you know, this is who I am. This is the information. You have misinformation on your site. You should correct it. And they'll take it down. Some of the time they'll just remove that myth and they'll put something else up like men don't get breast cancer. Right. And you know, you know, men do get, so they, they'll replace the bra one with that because of my objection. And then sometimes they won't, and they'll justify it by saying, as long as the American Cancer Society made that statement, which they could find on their website, that there's no, not enough evidence, there's no evidence to support the brown breast cancer link, and it makes no sense. It doesn't even make physiological sense is what they say, you know? So they, they even though I show them the study, I mean, this happened with a hospital that had on its website, bras don't cause breast cancer. I contacted the hospital. One took it down. Another hospital refused to take it down. And all they did was they put, according to the American Cancer Society, and then they gave that false information. And I said, how, how can you as a hospital that, that's treating and giving advice and information, how can you do that? I've shown you there are studies. How can you have a statement saying there are no studies coming from the American Cancer Society when I showed you there are studies? It's like they could say anything and if they're the experts, you have to believe them. And that's part of the problem. Both the media and uh, even the government. I contacted in one case, it was, it was coming from a hospital. They refused to change it. So I complained to the hospital. There's a board, a government board for hospital fraud or errors or whatever. And I contacted them. And I told them about this situation and they were trying to convince me that I'm wrong because the American Cancer Society says that there's no link. And I said, no, I, I'm an expert in this. I've researched, there's research and everything. It didn't matter. If you're the government or the media, if the expert guys say, like the American can't say this, that's all that matters. They cannot think for themselves. That's a culturogenic problem. Well, that, that goes into the whole education system, which I've studied extensively. I won't go down that road because we'll get too sidetracked. Yeah, but, that's why I forgot you know, what I was going to say, the, is sidetracking. The, Amer the American Cancer Society is, is appropriately named. Yes. It's designed to maintain a very profitable industry called cancer under the illusion of fighting cancer, which goes hand in hand with a whole pile of industries out well, there. I, and that's, what, that's, that's what my podcast is for, is to say, hey- yeah. Listen, everybody, wake exactly. up. Exactly. Guess what? You're in a nightmare and only you can do something <laughs> well, you're about the it. American and, cancer oh, by the way, when you wake up, you're going to find that it's a true nightmare. Look in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> Look at all the money you're spending on drugs and doctors and how much time you spend glued to your iPhone getting brainwashed by a very advanced technology, dot, dot, dot. Yes. Well, you know, but the American Cancer Society actually sells bras. And they- <laughs> doesn't surprise yes. me. <laughs> and I found out, I think I understand what they're really about. Their purpose is to make cancer less of a problem. It's to make it more acceptable and not make it so that you're marginalized. So that after you get cancer, they will give you a, a wig. They'll give you a bra. They'll try to renormalize you so you don't look like you've had cancer. So a lot of what they're doing is to try to take away the stigma, make it acceptable, almost fun. I mean, look at these, they have fun raising money for cancer. I mean, it, it's not a serious thing. It, everybody's having fun with their pink this is and that's and their bridges across you know, of bras across the, the river. And they do all of these interesting fun things to raise money and they want to make women. That's why they don't want women to think it's your fault. I mean, if if you uh, if if you think that you maybe did this to yourself, 
that is a very devastating thing for people to to admit to themselves. I mean, when we, I think that's why people go into denial so quickly. If if something went wrong and you feel you're responsible, I mean, the first thing anybody does anyway is say it's not my fault. I didn't do that. It's your fault that this happened. I mean, fault is very important in this culture. And if you ascribe fault to yourself, I am doing this to myself. Um, it, it's it's something that apparently blows people's minds too much so that the industry, the medical industry is actually trying to soften that blow. And I've e even seen doctors say that in opposition to dr dress to kill and bras and breast cancer, that they don't want to blame women that they, and this is coming from actually a spokesman at the American cancer site that women shouldn't feel it's their fault. And, uh, th so this is blaming the victim and, and it's making it terrible. We want them to, to feel good. So the American cancer society is not about changing the culture to get rid of cancer. It's about early detecting, treating, and um, mainstreaming cancer so that it's not a stigma for people who had it. And they do support of individuals here and there, although they do a lot less of that, I've heard. Um, but th that's, that's how I see it. And, and I, I feel that the authoritarianism, I mean, I quit medicine because I didn't want people to believe me because I'm a doctor. I mean, I was the top of my class. I've been in three PhD programs and I went to Duke University for two of them. And I've been in medical school. And so that's three PhDs and an MD program. And I have a master's degree because I didn't want, I spent two years and after two years, I thought all of these are so short-sighted and so limited to their field. They don't see the big picture. Uh, oh, great spirit. <laughs> you, you know, uh, uh, a couple of things uh, I think are important. One, if you look at the diets that are approved by organizations like the American Heart Society, the American Cancer Society, anybody with any knowledge in real diet, you know, with real knowledge of diet knows that that, that is just horseshit right there. Um, two, you know, we've been talking a lot about breasts and uh, I have an excellent podcast with Nicole Devaney, one of my instructors who went through a hell of an experience getting breasts removed and, and, uh, so there's a lot of great information for people. And we do talk about bras and, and related issues and, and constriction of circulation and things like that in there and scar tissue. Um, so just for the listeners, if you haven't listened to my interview with Nicole Devaney, it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's worth looping uh, back to listening to. Um, just to move us on well, so we don't there's a question, out of there's time. There's a question you made me think yeah. of that's very relevant for your listeners. I've heard yeah. massage therapists sometimes say that they, they need a bra while they're working. And in here, they're like, they, they should be, they should be models. So what, of course they so should. What is but, your advice but, to them for a female massage therapist who who's working? What can she do to keep her breasts from being um, in the way and without wearing a bra and modeling bad behavior? wear a baggier shirt and lead by example and decide which side of the balance you're going to be on the truth or a bunch of bullshit. So you feel comfortable advising massage. I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, they're going to wonder. I mean, some of them are going to say, I agree with this, but I can't go to work without my bra. You know, that that's the way they are because the culture says that's professional. Well, then wear, wear your bra and do what I tell all women to do that insist on wearing a bra. Loosen the bra to the point where when you take it off at the end of the day, there is absolutely no marks on your shoulders, your under yeah, breast area impossible. or your back. That's impossible though, for, of course. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's not impossible un unless you're somebody who sees what you can't do before you see what you can do and you're subservient to illusions that ultimately lead people to illness and disease and death. And if you're doing that while you're in the healthcare or medical profession, then you have a real moral crisis on your hands. And going back to your point about this fear of people feeling like it's my fault, all that, if you track that back, look, we're in a Judeo-Christian culture. Mm -hmm. The entire culture is programmed by Judeo-Christian ideology from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And anytime someone feels like, oh my God, it's my fault, they feel like they've sinned and therefore there is punishment involved. So mm -hmm. right when you follow these things back to the roots, it always mm -hmm. gets back to what, what is the dominant programming force? And my research showed very clearly the Catholic Church had brainwashing mastered by the 8th century, and they've been perfecting it ever since. There's a reason the Vatican's the richest corporation in the world. And, and, and again, I'm not against real religion, 
but I'm against hijacking people's minds, whether it be by religion or by mm -hmm. medicine or by an ism. Mm -hmm. And you know, when it comes to the ideas of diet, I have a very comprehensive series, an entire podcast series called The Honest Vegetarian that looks into this issue with a, a very exquisite detail with my senior instructor, Matthew Walden, who's a naturopathic and osteopathic physician. And so I don't want to railroad us with that topic. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. when you really start looking into this shit, you start seeing that people really lack common sense and they believe what's written on paper. And if someone writes MA or MS or PhD or MD behind it, they just believe it as though it's fact. Yes. And that's one of the most dangerous things you can do. So that's, that's the my, last couple. That's my point. Exactly. Yeah. The last couple things I want to cover here, just so we can um, keep it from getting too long for people. We've already covered a hell of a lot. And I'm sure we got a lot of people buzzing and I'm sure I'm going to get a combination of very upset people and, and people going hallelujah, which is fantastic because, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, you have to get stung by a bee to realize that you shouldn't hit bees. <laughs> 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 Meaning I'm just simply saying, I don't have any fear of, of uh, negative uh, feedback because I spent my entire life researching this and most of the negative feedback comes from people that haven't got a clue what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's just brainwashing and how it works. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to die for my cause because I can die knowing that I did my best to tell the truth based on an entire lifetime committed to people, to nature, to the environment, to human physiology, to human psychology. And that's what I've based my whole life on. And people that know me know that that's what I wear. And so yeah. in, sc in scanning the research on your website, I saw a statement in an abstract that I clipped. And just to mm -hmm. keep it short, I didn't get the whole title, but it's right off your website. And so I cut a section out I want to talk with you about. It says, univariate controlled logistic regression showed that the family history of malignant tumor and breast cancer, housing uh, decoration in the last 10 years, mammillary hyperplasia, and adverse life events, bra with steel rings, sleeping with a bra, high fat and pickle intake, poor sleep, were positively related to uh, cancer. So breast cancer. where yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah, breast cancer, where I'm uh, got some questions for you. Uh, what I'm specifically interested in are my concerns over the materials that bras are made of. Uh, mm -hmm. years and years ago when I was a massage therapist, I was, uh, in a very good sports massage therapy school that was, uh, founded by a Russian massage therapist in this, in Russia, it takes seven years to become a massage therapist and they treated as equal to MDs because of their expertise. Mm -hmm. And so it was, a, I chose that school and uh, specifically out of all the schools in the world to go to because of the quality of the education. And in our training, we had to study the what are called the trigger point manuals written by Janet Travell MD and David Simons MD and they're exquisite and thorough and in there she noticed all the way back in the 50s and uh, do you know what a trigger point is yes yeah so she noticed all the way back in the 50s that there was a very high incidence of trigger points in the upper trapezius and levator scapula of men and women who were wearing suits with foam shoulder pads in them hmm. She said she could not figure out why. So I, you talked about self-research, which we'll finish with. So um, what I, what happened to me was, I one, I, I do a lot of meditation. I've been doing Tai Chi consistently in meditation since meditation since I was 12. I studied with Master Fong Ha in around 2002 and have been consistent with my daily Tai Chi and Qigong practices. I took a course in medical Qigong. And I've been practicing and teaching this stuff for, you know, since 2002. And what happened is something very interesting. And this goes to your concept of self-research, which I teach all the time. Mm. I was, my master, Master Fong Ha, who's a legitimate master, uh, his first assignment for me was an exercise called Stand Like a Tree. Zen Zong means Stand Like a Tree for an hour a day for 100 consecutive days. If you miss a day, you have to start over. And so I went through training and to make a long story short, I did three gongs under his guidance, each different types of exercise. And by the time I got to the second gong, um, my 
my sensitivities were just wildly expanded. Uh, I'm, I'm a natural clairvoyant and I have other natural skills that Great Spirit gave me. But the practice of daily Tai Chi like that just really amplified my sensitivity to subtle energies. I could feel people's emotions. I could pick up on uh, on thoughts and feelings they were having, but they were they they themselves either were unaware of them, but they frequently led me back to real issues that were causing their health challenges, oftentimes relationship challenges that were behind their illnesses and diseases. Mm -hmm. And so, when what happened was. A friend of mine was traveling overseas and knew that I was really into Tai Chi. And I think he was in China or somewhere. And he bought me a, a Tai Chi suit with pants and, a you know, the Tai Chi, like almost like a martial arts gi. And it was made of organic cotton. And he sent it to me as a gift. And when I got the, the gift in the mail, I thought, oh, this is cool. I'm going to wear this today for Tai Chi. And so... I went and did my Tai Chi and I felt so much energy moving through me and, and my energy field felt so much more open. I thought, this is wild. And so back then I was wearing um, the pants that are kind of like sports material. They're kind of nylon like parachute type pants mm -hmm. and pa clothes that had uh, some synthetic to make them stretchy and things like that. So I thought, wow, I'm, I wonder what the hell the material is doing differently. It feels like it's letting my energy field breathe. So then I put my normal clothes back on. And sure enough, I felt like I was wrapped in plastic, like my energy field was suffocating. And so that I went and the next day, I put my organic clothes back on and boom, I was wide open again. So then I started looking into this and I found, because I can see people's energy fields, and I'd also had years and years of experience of, of people having chronic uh, problems with neck trigger points and shoulder and all the things. And I would track it back to the stuffing material and pillows that they were sleeping on. And anytime they had synthetic materials and a lot of the styrofoams, it would be the same kind of styrofoam they put in shoulder pads. And whenever I would have people take those out, it would significantly uh, reduce or eliminate a lot of the soft tissue pathology. So having had that experience, I have already hip to the fact there's something about synthetic materials that disrupts the energy field of the human body. Now, look, looking at all these bras, one of the things I noticed is 99.99% of the bras worn out there are made of synthetic materials. And so I started telling women, get organic bras, and then I gave them all the other suggestions, and many women came back and said, oh my God, I feel so much better now that I'm wearing this organic material, and I explained you know, what I'd found through my own investigations. The other thing is I found countless cases in my career and I you know I used to repair weapon systems in Cobra helicopters. I spent a year, 8 hours a day in advanced electronics, so I understand a lot about electronics and how antenna systems work and how frequencies work and how waves work and how they affect tissue. I've studied all these relevant sciences. And so one of the things I started noticing as I was getting all sorts of female athletes with chronic low back pain and gynecological problems that had belly button rings. Hmm. And so my first thought was that they're wearing an antenna. They're wearing an electromagnetic attractor. That's what an antenna is. And so when you look at the frequency rate, for example, of cell phones, they're in the microwave frequency. So a belly button ring can easily pick up microwave frequencies. So what I did is I started taking women's belly button rings out and then retesting the function of their abdominal walls, their pelvic floor, and looking for, for factors like how much does your SI joint pain? And I had case after case after case and demonstrated this all over the world on stage, right in front of hundreds and hundreds of people on stage every time, that if I take the belly button ring out, all of a sudden their abdominal wall turns on and oftentimes chronic back and SI joint pain disappears. And I would demonstrate this. Then I'd put the belly button back ring back in. And within seconds, the pain would be back and the abdominal wall would shut off. And I was showing that anytime you have metal in or on your body, it's attracting electromagnetic frequencies, which we now know increases the heat of the body, causes chronic inflammation. Research shows by, I, I found a research study by a researcher named Ross Addy. He showed the cell phone strength that a cell phone communicates at is one million times more powerful than the amount of energy that brain cells use to talk to each other, which is why when people hold cell phones to their head and the signal goes through their brain, 
that it causes brain cancer because it's completely and utterly disrupting the normal communications and blasting the system. I mean, imagine if we turned the volume up on either of our voice one million times, it would just you know blow the speakers to smithereens. So some of the questions that I, I, I things I wanted to share with you is have you had any connection to the relationship between synthetic materials and the underwires and metal clips and bras and the pathology that women are experiencing or is what I'm sharing novel to you? Uh, what you're saying is not novel. It's very interesting. Um, I've heard uh, there has been concern about the underwire in the bras being an antenna. Um, yes. I, I, um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure of it, but I'm, I'm hearing your experience. That's that helps confirm that. Um, the the other thing is the actual material of the bra is very important. Um, synthetic material is a polymer, and it breaks down into monomer units, which can be a problem. Like one three butadiene is one of the monomers of the polymer for for like uh, for uh, uh, poly. Uh, Polyesters will break down to 1,3-butadiene, and that is a carcinogen. I was told that by actually a chemist uh, after my book first came out. She contacted me and she said, you know, the, the bra itself can be delivering the carcinogens as they break down, the, the nylon in the bra. Yeah, they even, they even start to stink as they yeah. age. Well, the other thing is the bra is washed in the detergent and it, the detergents have residue and and the fabric softeners. So you're putting all of the chemicals and the sweat and everything that's in the bra um, that didn't get out with the washing. All of that is very intimately connected to your skin. So your skin could absorb these chemicals. And there are bras now that are trying to be, you know, organic cotton and and you know, um, uh, they're they're focusing on on that aspect of the bra specifically. I, I know of several bra manufacturers who are trying to mitigate the problem created by either constriction and or by the, uh, the materials in the bra itself and, and try to have organic uh, material. But you know, you can have an organic bra, but if it's tight, you know, it's not going to help. When the bra first came out, some, some alternative health guys said, what if we took magnets and put them in the bra? Would that, would that improve circulation and help? And I said, I don't see why that would help. I mean, these guys were into magnets. And that was what they were trying to find what can we sell, right? So yeah, of course. one guy wanted to know, is there any lymphatic uh, herb that'll improve the lymphatics? You know, let's let women. And then I, I loved it when people would say, actually, I hated it. I'm being sarcastic. When they'd say, well, you know, women are going to wear bras anyway. So let's just come up with like a safer mousetrap. And I never really got into that mentality. I mean, to me, I'm... I think I'm more like you in, 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 uh, if it's bad, you don't do it. You don't just play with it and compromise and, and, you know, and go into bargaining. Um, you know, those are like the stages of grief that people go through when you tell them their lifestyle is killing them. They, they do the denial and they'll do the bargaining like, well, what if I just do it this much? And, and then they'll do uh, the depression and then the anger, they'll get angry at you for telling them. Yeah. And, it's called the grief cycle. Yes. Until they finally get to acceptance. And, um, you know, over the years, it's really funny. I mean, when I first came out with this, when, when we first did this, discovered this and our book came out, we were so uh, proselytizing because we thought we just, I mean, we had to let everyone know. So if I was in line, I remember being in line at a, in, a, in a store and the woman in front of me, you know, she was wearing a tight bra. I mean, her her shoulders and to talk about the pressure i mean you've seen the grooves in these shoulders that oh, yes. especially large it's so ironic large breasted women in fiji where they didn't wear bras they'd say my breasts are too big i can't wear a bra and they didn't have breast problems and then you go to a culture where they wear bras and they say oh my breasts are big i need a bra i need to support them and which is like the word support i don't even know what that means i, I think they mean lift them and push them in but it's not like you have to support them or they will, you'll step on them, um, you know, but they, they believe they need the bras. And then what's happening is the bra creates dependency. And, um, and then you're, you're in this, um, you're trying to get them out of it and they, they can't believe it's even possible. So, uh, yeah. they, and, and you were asking, you wanted to ask in these questions, why do they feel compelled to wear it when sleeping? Um, you know, they're, they're really uncomfortable with their bodies. I think women, have become so brainwashed into thinking that their breasts are not their own. They're, they're, they're for the viewer. They're, they're really like not part of their own well, body. 
and there's your Judeo Christian programming and Islamic programming. And you know, Although, if you go to India, you don't see you don't see uh, nearly you see naked people walking around all over the place because they don't have the same um, cultural program. You know, there's one Muslim culture that that I forget which one it is. One of the really extreme guys, they banned bras. Um, well, good. At least they got something right. <laughs> Um, so that, that's interesting. So some of these, of course, uh, some Muslim cultures ban chess, uh, the game chess. They think it's a waste of time and it's banned. Um, well, yeah. So, you know, so, human oh. beings are wild and interesting <laughs> creatures. They really a couple, are. A couple points I wanted to, to bring up just for the listeners, uh, and you might enjoy them too. Um, going back to the metal, you know, I teach a very comprehensive course. Check level three shows you how to evaluate cranial nerves occlusal functions, ocular functions, auditory vestibular functions, upper cervical functions, and how all those cranial nerves regulate the entire body and and how if you don't identify problems there, you can treat musculoskeletal, digestive, eliminative, glandular problems till the cows come home because the hierarchy of control is structured in the body and the and the cranial nerves are really regulating the entire system because that's where all of our survival centers are. If you can't see, your chances of dying in nature are good. Mm -hmm. If you can't hear, your chances of dying in nature are good. If your teeth don't work, your chances of dying are good. If you can't breathe, your chances of dying are good. If your vestibular system malfunctioning, your chances of falling over and breaking a leg are really good. So the whole musculoskeletal system is being regulated by the key control centers that keep us alive. So what I do is I show, and I have shown many case histories, and I've seen you know more patients than I can count with this because nose rings are very popular, as I'm sure you're aware, and they're almost always made of metal. And there's an actual medical condition, a dental condition, called banana face. And what happens is if someone has a growth and development disorder where one side of the mandible is longer than the other side, then the mandible does not fit into the maxilla and they have malocclusion and it leads to all sorts of strange postural abnormalities, scoliosis, and a lot of complicated problems. And so having done this training with Roccobato and learned how to recognize all these uh, you know, craniofacial and dental abnormalities that were causing chronic low back pain and all the sort of thing, a lot of things that people run to orthopedic uh, doctors and therapists for, not realizing it's coming from the head, I started noticing that any time I saw a woman, I, I, you don't see as many men, but lots of women wearing a nose ring, I found that usually within about one to three years, what was happening is the fascia begins to tighten because fascia is an electric, which means it it causes it actually has a contractile force if it's energetically excited. And so when when you get things like uh, cell phones and uh, radio waves and all the electromagnetic pollution that's out there being picked up by the nose ring, it electrifies the fascia, which causes binding. And, and for people to understand that, I say, how many of you have been to an acupuncturist? Usually almost every hand in the room goes up. How many of you have had an acupuncturist try to pull a needle out of you and it was stuck in your body and they had to either twist the needle or wait to get it out and almost every hand goes up. I see that's because when you put an acupuncture needle into a meridian in your body, you're using a metal antenna that's sucking environmental energy in. And if it's done right, they can energize the meridian. But if they overstimulate the fascia, it will cause what's called needle bind or needle grip. So if you already understand that, then you know that electricity running through metal can electrify the fascia. And I've shown many case histories where you can actually see the whole face being pulled so the jaw moves to the side that the nose rings on, the, the orbit of the eye on that side, the eye socket actually constricts and the eye on that side looks smaller and the whole side of the cranium is actually compressed so they end up having what looks exactly like a medical diagnosis of banana face. In fact, my assistant that worked for me for 11 years, when she came to work for me, the first thing I said is you got to get the nose ring out and when I took her in front of a mirror and showed her how to look at what I was seeing as a therapist, she, she, she was just flabbergasted. But typically, I found that within as little as two weeks, the, the structure will unwind and start to normalize. So I'm giving ways for women to understand how important it is to not wear metal and bras. And even the clips on bras are, are mm -hmm. uh, electromagnetic attractors. And then I've proven thousands and thousands of times I can take somebody do a, a standard deltoid muscle test and then put foam shoulder pads 
or a foam pillow next to their body and re-muscle test them. It'll make them go weak. So you don't like foam uh, mattresses for beds? Absolutely not. And, and interestingly, sudden infant death syndrome was tracked right back to chemical outgassing of foam mattresses that was poisoning the babies and killing them, which led to doctors all over the world telling mothers never to let their kids sleep on their stomach, which completely and utterly screws up the normal infant development uh, cycle because all the reflexes that are built into the body, most of them are on the front of the body. So if you sleep a child on its back, it will not have normal infant development because the body has pressure points that activate key uh, programs in the brain stem and in the brain that integrate the glands, the organs, and the musculoskeletal system so that the body begins to integrate and work properly. And I've taught infant development all over the world, and countless is the number of kids that have serious infant development and even professional athletes. I find loads of professional athletes with infant development disorders, many of which were told their mothers told them they couldn't sleep on their stomachs. Um, That's interesting. I, I actually have, we, we should talk about sleep some other time. I I've done sleep research and, um, and, um, head of, uh, it, it, the problem with stomach sleeping is your head has to go to the side. And when your head goes to the side, it, it, it increases brain pressure. Um, it could, yeah, that, it, that you, it impairs we, we drainage. should talk about, I, I have to, yeah. uh, I'll have to give you a very long discussion and my senior instructor is an expert and he's studied primal sleep postures and, uh, don't forget we were designed to survive in nature. And if you look at all the research that I've looked at and you look at how we're designed, the body has many compensating factors and you'd have to study people that have open carotid and open vertebral arteries before you could ever determine mm -hmm. if those pressures were the response of a normal or a pathological body. So that you have to be very careful with making too many assumptions on that one. But uh, anyhow, you can test this with muscle testings. You also, anybody that's ever been inside of a building with a phone knows if you want to get better reception, you got to go stand by a window. What's that telling you? Metal is sucking the signal up so it can't get to your phone. If you stand by a window, your phone reception is better. Well, if the metal's in your body, it'll do the mm -hmm. same thing. One of the things that I wanted to touch on with you a bit too that I find a bit of a, a problem is I have seen too many times to count children females like when they're seven eight nine ten years old they don't even have any boobs yet they don't even have swollen nipples and their parents are already or their mothers are already putting them in bras right. and it's like training bras. that is bad bad news yeah. i mean that's just now you're talking about all the things we've been talking about right in a child's body that's growing and developing and when you just consider the light lactic elastic forces that I talk about alone, that can alter the growth and development of the child's body. Well, that's why I, in Dress to Kill, I talk about how, um, I mean, the, the, one of the risk factors for breast cancer is early puberty. And I think the reason that's a risk factor isn't because that's when you get exposed to estrogen and female hormones, because I don't think they're the problem. I think the big problem is if, if the early puberty, that's when you strap the kid in, in a bra. And if she's nine years old the effect of that pressure is going to be even more deleterious than if she's 12 or 13 or 14 because the younger the body, the more plastic it is and the more you're going to impact on it. So I totally agree. And the reason they give them training bras is to get them used to the idea that they need to wear a bra. It's like training a horse to get used to a saddle, you know? They're, they're, yeah, or a bridle. Yeah, it, it's it's to get used to the discomfort. Um, and that's, that's really what they're training them for. Cause it's, it's nothing for the breasts, obviously. Um, yeah. I think the other thing that we didn't mention since we're doing all sorts of stuff for people to think about it, getting back to sleep. If you are a belly sleeper as an adult, um, you're going to lean on your breast. And if you're constricting them all day in a bra and then you finally take it off to go to bed and then you lie on your breasts, especially if you lie on one breast more than the other. Let's say you're a right side sleeper. And you, so you typically are leaning on your right breast more than your left. Um, you know, this stretching and, and pushing of the breast day after day for hours, you're going to start having asymmetry develop even more than you might have otherwise. So I think one of the causes for breast asymmetry and for asymmetrical breast cancer, uh, one factor is... Um, well, first, when you buy a bra, both cups are the same size. And if your breasts are different sizes, one breast is going to be more constricted than the other. So the breast that's larger will probably be the one that's going to get more 
uh, disease as a result of the bra because it's going to be more constricted. Um, so that's something for women to th think about how you sleep, the compression, you know, it's all going to cut down on circulation. So if you want to optimize circulation, you don't want to constrict your breasts and you probably want to be in your back. I'm a big believer in back sleeping and head of bed elevation to improve brain circulation. And uh, so I, I don't agree with some of the things you were saying about belly sleeping, although I'm sure what you're, the facts are there, but there's other facts too uh, that that complicated. It's complicated. I mean, sudden infant. In, uh, we could talk about that another time. But uh, yeah, I don't. I, but I don't want to get too far off because I'll right. have to open up a whole can of worms. And I've studied this extensively. Yeah. It, it could be five podcasts. Well, I wrote a and book. Like I, I wrote said, a book on it called "Get It Up," um, about elevating <laughs> your head. And it's that sounds like it's another topic. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, it's it, compression. It's, it's all about circulation. I mean, I think if I look at what contribution I've made to this discussion, it's to let uh, people realize that we need to properly have proper circulation. You don't want anything tight and you want to be aware of gravity and how that, how you're, you know, leaning on things, compression injuries. I think there's much, all of the compression injury, anytime you're leaning or having tight clothing, um, you're going to affect circulation. And um, we, we just have to be aware of the need for proper circulation. I think that's the key to health. If your body can circulate, it can heal any part of it. It's, it's made to heal. But if part of the body isn't circulating, it's basically being cut off from the rest and it'll ultimately deteriorate. And to what degree depends on on how extensive the problem is. But so that's my, uh, I just wanted to add that sleep position thing to just think about that because that does explain asymmetry. And most women, the left breast is bigger than the right breast, um, but not necessarily. And, and leaning on them at the end of the day can't be good for eight hours at night. And sleeping, well, and if you sleep with, a, with clothes on, you're going to constrict yourself even more and affect circulation. So it's probably good to sleep naked. Um, on your, yeah. One, uh, of, one of the reasons the left breast is likely to be bigger is because most women are right-handed. So they hold their infants in their left arm and therefore the child's got access to the left breast. So it's going to get more, it's the more they suck it, the more it's going to produce milk and the more interaction that it's going to have. So that's one factor that can play into that. And the sleep postures, I'll introduce you to my senior instructor, Matthew Walden, by email. He's done extensive research into this, and mm -hmm. one of his mentors has spent years and years researching sleep postures. And I could easily go through mm -hmm. and explain the physiology of the musculoskeletal system and all the mechanisms it has designed to make sure you keep your body moving at night. In fact, I don't remember the exact number, but the average person uh, changes body position something like 172 times a night. <laughs> And if they don't, it means they have some kind of a pathology in the musculoskeletal system and they're avoiding pain, which limits range of motion because they have to avoid pain, such as a disc injury, for example. Mm -hmm. So these are all things I've looked into mm -hmm. with great detail. Mm -hmm. I make my living solving very challenging cases and I have to look into this stuff. So I would just say to you, remember, keep the open mind, of otherwise you, you can fall in love with an idea that may not be that true and i'll hook you up with uh, with matthew and he can give you all sorts of ex excellent stuff to look into sure well anything more we want to talk about bras and breast cancer i think i think we've done a great job and i've really enjoyed our conversation it's been very passionate and we've given lots of people to think uh things to think about and things to investigate and uh you know you've got some great books they can look into you got your website and uh, just I think just to kill it's just also come out as an audio book um oh great yeah. yeah i saw that when i went on amazon yeah congratulations well thank you i mean the the publisher just had it done and it's available exclusively on audible amazon and itunes so yeah i think that's going to be great a lot of people are into audios because they're so much easier to get through while you're you know exercising driving yeah. cars or whatever yeah and again i, I encourage if, if women want to try to figure out whether their bra is harming them or not just do a self-study, try it. And, and the bra-free study is basically that. Uh, it's, it's just asking women to go without a bra, nothing constrictive. And then we just ask some questions of how you feel. And we just want to follow them over the years. And, and it's, it's encouraging to see the kind of improvement in overall health, in addition to just directly breast health, that these women are experiencing. So um, if they want to check that out, just go to brafreestudy.org or .com, either one. And, um, 
And then my website, brasandbreastcancer.org, will give you references to some of the research that's come out supporting the bra and breast cancer link. But the big, and, uh, yeah, the most important research is that on your own body. You know, just right. Just yes, see absolutely. How you feel. It's called pay attention. Yeah, I tell people all the time. It takes a good ten years of dysfunctional living to create cancer, unless you have a rare toxic exposure. Like I've worked with a lot of firemen that get cancer quite quickly from being in burning buildings where there's very carcinogenic chemicals that they're breathing in. And it takes uh, a lot of work to create obesity. Point being is you don't. Doesn't happen overnight. If you, if you look in the mirror and watch what's going on, you can say, okay, I'm doing something wrong. I got to start investigating. And if you wait for somebody in the medical system to tell you what you're doing wrong, all you're going to do is end up on a bunch of drugs that are cause toxicity and disrupt your physiology. When really often it's as simple as, uh, drink good water, eat real food, move your body. When it uh, go to the toilet, when you need to go to the toilet, and go to sleep when you're tired, and that's uh, a very very safe place to begin healing. Because without those things happening, nobody heals anyhow. You know, I wrote a book about about uh, going to the toilet and other things called get it off, get it out. And it was oh, so you got get it up and get it out and get it off, and also uh, the doctor is out, and um, in addition to dressed to kill. Yeah. We, we discovered a, one of the things I'll, I'll close with something that's totally unrelated to this, but I think you'll find it interesting and research is starting to come out proving this correct. Um, the thyroid, maybe you already know about this, but the thyroid is right next to the voice box for a reason. It, the laryngeal vibration from speaking actually stimulates your thyroid. And I've run into cases where people get hypothyroid because they stop talking or hyperthyroid because they've been yelling and it overstimulates. And so the, the, the thyroid function is more than just the brain, you know, axis with thyroid releasing hormone and TSH. Yeah. It's also laryngeal vibration. And they've, they've been doing studies now showing that when you vibrate the thyroid, it releases thyroxin and with voice. So yeah. the use of our voice in thyroid function is a whole is another thing that medicine didn't even know about. But somebody told me that Ayurvedic medicine knew about that thousands of years ago, but we don't hear about it anyway. Well, yeah, Steiner Steiner has extensive uh, information on that and the effects of the voice on the body, and it is in it's in. Uh, Ayurveda. It's in a few places, but it's just not common knowledge. Yeah, it should be. A lot of it's a lot of uh, cases. I've run into people that they get their thyroid ablated by you know radioactive iodine, the way doctors do it, um, before they even look at whether it's temporary or permanent. You know, they're very quick to get you on TSH. I mean, on, on, thyro yeah. on thyroxin. So yeah. you know, anyway. But that's that's something I just wanted to share with you. Um, you you don't have to. Yeah, you know. yeah. It's very interesting. Well. It's been fun, uh, and I really appreciate your passion and your interest in helping women and creating awareness. And uh, yeah, and I've really enjoyed you know. it too. And I think uh, we should have met twenty five years ago because you're doing a lot of the stuff that I would have loved doing, but I've been pretty much doing it myself. Uh, and uh, it would have been nice if we had worked together and <laughs> developed these these uh, alternative ways of seeing how the body works through culture and lifestyle and stuff like that. So Yeah. Well, yeah. you know what I'm going to do for you as a gift uh, to say thank you for all the work you've done. I'm going to give you a guest pass to my holistic lifestyle coaching program online. That's uh, It's my public acts. It's public. It's designed for the public to learn the basics of holistic health and how to take care of themselves. It looks at uh, nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and moving. And I think you'll find it absolutely fascinating. Well, I, w I will. Thank you very much. I look forward to that. Well, absolutely great time. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with as many people as you can. Uh, if you, if we upset you, feel free to share your uh, commentaries, uh, anything. Uh, I like to stay open-minded. My philosophy is always look at both sides of an argument before you make a decision. Otherwise, you can um, trick yourself into actually thinking you know what's going on. So I'm very open to feedback, resources. Um, let's all work on this together. Put it all on the table. Let's be adult about it and democratic about it and uh, see if we can find ways to make uh, the world a healthier place for the children and support each other and support nature. And uh, that's really what life and love is all about. So uh, 
enjoy, and I'll talk to you along the way in our next podcast. And uh, Sid, thank you very much. Well, thank you. It was great meeting you, Paul. Okay, great. You too. And I'll look forward to maybe talking to you in the future when you have new and interesting things that we can get into. Okay, sounds good. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Sid Singer. Paul recommends Professor Singer's book, the second edition of Dress to Kill, The Link Between Breast Cancer and Bras, which is available on Amazon. You can find more about Professor Singer's work online at brasandbreastcancer.org and brafreestudy.com. Both sites have excellent resources pages with links to articles and more. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's brand new streaming media site, checkiva.com. The.com. 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 The dot com.